their seats. The New Yorkers are still talking. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to uh, our event, Applying the Evidence. Um, the purpose of today's event is to discuss legal and policy answers to uh, reducing opioid overdose deaths, morbidity, and mor mortality in this country, and with a particular focus on the criminal justice and child welfare systems. Um, the event's been many months in the making, and uh, my name is Regina LaBelle. I'm the uh, director of the initiative at the O'Neill Institute on Addiction and Public Policy. So I want to thank the incredible staff at the O'Neill Institute, uh, many of whom are here today who helped put together this event. Uh, Mary Angel, uh, Johan, Emily, Katie, Felix, Sonia, Jeff, and of course Shelley Weissman, who is our associate director of the initiative on addiction and public policy. And I also want to thank uh, Summer Brown and Margarita Senia for their invaluable assistance in both putting together the report that you will receive today and putting together this event. Uh, there are many other people who I want to thank, but I'll, I'll put them aside as the day goes on. We have advisory board members and speakers here. So the agenda for today um, is, it's, it is uh, complex and involves many of the, what we think are the areas of greatest import to reducing overdose deaths and, uh, and, and also helping people with substance use disorders uh, lead, um, lead effective, um, bountiful lives going forward. So the report we released this week is intended to provide additional depth to the conversations that we'll have here today. Each of you should have this. Uh, the report, it also is um, available to you online. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't especially point out and appreciate the Arnold, Arnold Ventures and Julie Wygand and, uh, and Sarah Twardock, who were instrumental throughout the year. This has been about a year in the making in putting together the report as well as uh, this event. And Arnold Ventures funding has been instrumental in making sure that you all are here today. So throughout the day, we've brought, sought to bring together the various voices affected by addiction, experts in the field of addiction, criminal justice, and child welfare, including people with lived experience on every panel. Our theme today is advancing the evidence, uh, which is a bit of a, uh, a wonky title, but what we're seeking to do today is really to move from rescue to recovery. Because while rescuing people is important, we also need to look around the corner to begin the difficult process that's ahead of us of building communities of recovery, where we take people where they are. That includes everyone involved in the policy press process who might not be where they should be today. That we meet people where they are and bring them so that they embrace the mission of recovery that we are all here today to discuss. Um, People in recovery often hear and understand the importance of individual change, and all, each of us does, the type of individual change that's necessary to bring about sustained recovery. And while that is emphasized to people during treatment and during recovery, what we haven't done is emphasize the importance of institutional change. And that means each and every one of our systems and institutions have to change if we're going to build communities of recovery going forward. That can begin with the basics of the language that we use to describe substance use disorders and those with substance use disorders, and as well as our systems such as our criminal justice systems and our child welfare systems, funding systems and the laws underpinning all of our drug policies. Each and every one of these systems has to be subject to change, and we can't be afraid to look at our systems and say, what do I need to do here differently? So as we look at each topic that we'll discuss today, we should ask ourselves, what are the institutional changes that are required? Are these changes happening? And what will it take to move faster and bring about the change that's needed as we seek to move from rescue to recovery? 
So as part of that change and to start the conversation, the first um, presentation we'll have this morning is with the Hoya Dope Project. These are um, medical students at Georgetown who have embraced change by uh, providing naloxone training, providing naloxone kits across the city. And they've been incredible enthusiastic partners uh, that we really have uh, enjoyed working with over the last couple of months. So the first step we're gonna take is uh, inviting them up to uh, do the, um, I'm not sure where they are, however, uh, to do the naloxone training. And uh, then, there they are, and then we'll have our first panel. And so um, I will be back after they are done and uh, presenting. There will be naloxone available uh, also for you to take home. And so I would ask each of you to come up. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're thrilled to be here as volunteers. Thank you. <laughs> We're thrilled to be here as volunteers from the Hoya Drug Overdose Prevention and Education Project, also known as the Hoya Dope Project. Um, we're Georgetown medical students um, whose aim has really twofold. One, to um, contribute to the um, large effort, effort here in DC to address the opioid crisis, as well as preparing future physicians to be able to um, take care of patients in, in the future with opioid use disorder. And basically we do that by training medical students to go out into the community um, to provide um, education and information to DC community members who are at highest risk of experiencing or witnessing a opiate overdose about how to recognize the signs of an overdose as well as how to safely intervene with the life-saving opioid antagonist medication naloxone which is also known as Narcan. Um, our role today um, is to uh, also share that information that we go out into the community to do um, I'll talk just briefly a little bit more about a couple of our partnerships and then we'll dive into the bulk of the, the training. Um, so we're thrilled that many of our volunteers um, also come from the Hoya Clinic, which is a Georgetown um, free student run clinic. Um, it recently reopened um, after moving from the um, DC um, DC General Shelter to the Triumph Shelter um, in, the, in the local community. Um, and we're also very grateful to the DC Department of Health and the mayoral campaign, Live Long DC, for their collaboration and um, generosity in providing naloxone for us to be able to distribute every time we go out into the community and provide this informational session. Um, they're also um, sponsoring the naloxone that we'll be able to give out today. And we encourage you all to come see us during the break time um, at a table outside to pick up a kit, um, ask any questions that you may have, we're, we're available. Um, and then lastly, we're kind of constantly looking for opportunities to um, expand how we can contribute to the um, humongous effort here in DC to address, um, address the opioid crisis, um, as well as how we can prepare ourselves as future medical professionals to be in the best position um, to take care of these unique patients. Um, and we're really proud of the Georgetown University School of Medicine for their most recent addition to the curriculum, starting with the class of 2021, of incorporating the buprenorphine um, X waiver prescribing training into that curriculum. So last thing, I just wanna draw your attention as well to our email address that's up on the screen here. Um, we encourage you all to reach out to us if you have any questions about the, the content of the presentation, if you'd like to hear more about our work, um, if you're interested in um, discussing a training out in the community with any organizations that you may be a part of, or, um, or if you just have ideas for ongoing projects. We're, we're really eager to expand what we can provide and would love to collaborate with any one of you. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it along. So when opioids get into the body, they bind to receptors throughout, including in the brain and brainstem. They attach to receptors on nerve cells and they decrease the sensation of pain. They also reduce anxiety and create a sensation of euphoria. 
Um, what they also do is importantly bind to a point in the brainstem that's responsible for regulating breathing. Um, and what we do day to day is not really think so much actively about our breathing rate. So we are we rely pretty heavily on our brainstem to um, to produce signals for us to maintain our regular breathing rate. And when we have foreign substances in there that interfere with that signaling, it can be dangerous. Um, so when we have foreign substances in there like opioids, we can have things that decrease that drive to breathe. So when we see people that have opioids in their systems, um, the symptoms of being really high include feelings of sedation, euphoria, reduced anxiety, and you see things like relaxed muscles, slowed speech, slurred speech, they might be sleepy, their head might be nodding if they can't hold it up. They'll respond to stimulation, but at greater levels, so pain stimulation might be, they might be responsive to it, like a sternal rub if you take your fingers and rub it on their chest, um, just responding to stimuli at a higher level. Um, but over time, as you continue to use the substance, tolerance develops, so you need more and more of the same substance to elicit the same response. And that can be dangerous when you're thinking about opioids that operate at a center that decreases your drive to breathe. So when you have an overdose and you're using more and more of the same substance, then you'll have decreased respiration that manifests as things like a deep snoring, a death rattle, so a decreased expiration, infrequent or no breathing, they might not be breathing at all, um, pale skin, clammy skin, sweaty skin, um, a heavy nod, they might not respond to stimulation anymore, a slowed heart rate, just decreased respiratory output, decreased output from the brain. Um, and overall, what's lethal about opioid overdoses is that ultimately it decreases the drive to breathe from the brainstem, so you will stop breathing ultimately. So now we're going to cover how naloxone uh, works, and just for reference, as Erica mentioned, um, Narcan is the brand name for naloxone, so uh, same, same uh, substance there. So. Um, Naloxone is a opioid antagonist, and so what that means is when um, naloxone gets onto the receptor that the opioid is sitting on, it knocks it off right away, um, and so it essentially reverses the high um, that the patient is experiencing, um, and that's really useful in an opioid overdose setting, um, and so that is um, how we treat a patient with an opioid overdose. Um, and so it takes two to three minutes to um, to exert its effect. So really quickly, you, you could expect the patient to sort of sit up, be uh, alert, maybe even a little bit uh, agitated as well. Um, so that will happen very quickly. Uh, an important point to, uh, to note is that it only works for about 30 to 90 minutes, and an opioid can last in the body for much longer. So it's important to, um, even if the patient looks alert and you know, very active, um, you still need to have them seek medical attention. So calling 911 is still very important um, and having them come to medical attention so that physicians can sort of watch as they um, sort of run through the high um, and make sure that they're not gonna slip back into a high once the Narcan or Naloxone uh, wears off. Um, so it's not a substitute for uh, emergency care. Um, so with that introduction, we're going to go through the actual steps about how to administer naloxone or Narcan. Um, so the first thing to do when you um, notice someone who might be um, overdosed from opioids is to um, assess their responsiveness. And some of the ways that you can do that is um, doing the sternal rub. So placing your fist on their chest, in the middle of their chest, and rubbing down. Um, and if they respond to that, um, you might just observe them a little longer, but if they don't respond to that, that can indicate that they are um, experiencing an overdose. Um, you can also shake their toe if you don't feel comfortable pressing on their sternum right away, but um, the, the best way to elicit whether or not someone is responsive is by the, that sternal rub. Um, so to assess for the responsiveness and also their breathing, so um, to see if their chest is rising, um, the rate at which it's, it's rising is important as well. Um, and then the next step would be to call 911 or have someone around you to call, call 911. As Emily mentioned, um, naloxone is very effective at temporarily reversing an overdose, but it's not a substitute for emergency care. Um, and it's really important to get people into that setting that can, they can be observed and treated with um, 
or, or they're um, high or their overdose will be observed for a longer period of time so we can make sure that they get the medical attention that they need um, from there on. Um, so the next uh, step would be to perform rescue breathing to deliver some oxygen if you feel comfortable. So that would be, involve um, tilting their chin back to deliver breaths um, mouth to mouth um, and just to observe if their chest rises, that is an indicator that the breath has gone in. Um, but the most important thing to do if someone is experiencing an overdose is to administer naloxone or Narcan. Um, so the kits that we're going to hand out have these steps all outlined, um, so you don't have to memorize them right now. Um, but the, the way that you administer naloxone is to place the person on their back with their, uh, with their head tilted back um, to um, uh, expose their nostrils. Um, so you would insert the, the full, um, full nozzle into the nose and spray the entire dosage into one nostril. So you don't divide it between the two nostrils. You just insert it into and spray it into one. Um, so it, as men, Emily mentioned, again, it only works for 30 to 90 minutes. So it is important to, to get them to care, um, but it does take two to three minutes to work. So after you administer that first dose, um, observe them for two to three minutes. If they start to respond, um, that's an indicator that the dose has worked. Um, if they don't respond after two to three minutes, um, the kit has a second dose, so you can go ahead and um, administer that second dose of naloxone. Um, and then once you've delivered the dose, um, it's important to place the person in the recovery position because they could be agitated, um, they could experience, experience some vomiting. Um, so the way that you do that is to place their hands um, up by their cheeks and then um, cross one leg over the other as a picture is demonstrating and um, that can prevent them from choking on their vomit if they do vomit after coming out of their overdose. So, so if, if you have a question, if you could go to the mic and say your name, uh, that would be great. So because it's being streamed live, thanks. And I'll just re repeat really quick. The question was um, about the um, increasing um, availability of fentanyl or even and whether or not the person who's using opiates on the street is aware that they're using fentanyl or not, um, is, which is a, a much more potent um, opioid and often will require more doses of naloxone in order to revo reverse the opioid overdose. Um, and so this is exactly why the kits that are now standard um, that are being passed out all have two doses within the kit um, because they were, it, we are seeing that um, individuals may require two doses to overcome the amount of uh, opioid that is in their system. Um, the way, the best way to know whether or not someone needs that second dose um, is to administer the first dose. We expect that if that um, naloxone should kick in within two to three minutes. Um, so. The, we suggest that you just stick around, observe that person for a couple of minutes, see if they start to, if their breathing starts to become a little bit deeper, um, if they are um, starting to wake up a little bit more, becoming more responsive. Um, as Rita mentioned, um, the, they might also um, experience symptoms of kind of sickness of, of acute opioid withdrawal, like nausea, headache, um, that is, is not uncommon, but kind of seeing that is an indication that that first dose is working. If you're not really seeing much change after a couple of minutes, then the, then the recommendation is to administer that second dose um, because that may exactly be what's going on. The, the great thing about naloxone is that um, if you know there is an instance where you administer a couple of doses of naloxone and the person has not, does not have opioids in their system, there's very minimal risk of giving that to someone. Um, so that's why it's a very safe medication, um, and we err on the side of um, giving the medication when there's a suspicion that there's an opioid overdose versus withholding that treatment, given that it is life-saving and the risk is, is very minimal. Questions? 
questions? Great. Well, we'll be available out. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Margarita. Um, I just have a question about the rescue breathing. Like, how long do you recommend performing that before administering the, the naloxone? Thank yeah. you. Um, so initially when naloxone came out, the rescue breathing was a um, formal part of the the administration process. Um, that's subsequently been changed to it being really a, uh, um, an optional component. The, you know, the rationale for um, giving rescue breathing is to help increase the oxygen level in the person's body, um, assuming that they have stopped breathing or at least re significantly reduced their breathing on, um, in the in the overdose situation. So there isn't a formal kind of recommended um, amount of time that you would do that. Really, um, you know, if you administer a couple of breaths and then quickly go to the naloxone or even just jump to the naloxone um, without doing the rescue breathing, there's, there hasn't been shown to be um, significant difference in outcomes as far as whether or not rescue breathing is administered or not. Good morning, ladies. I just want to, first of all, my name is Lippy Roy. I'm an internal medicine and addiction medicine physician. And I want to say I'm so thankful to all of you for sharing this really life-saving information. Uh, I didn't learn any of this during medical school or during my training, so I'm really proud of you for, for <laughs> learning this and, and then teaching the public. You're merely making a difference. Just really quickly, does Georgetown um, Medical School have a curriculum teaching addiction? And you may or may not know this. Do you know if any of their residency programs are also teaching either their internal medicine, pediatrics, ob any of their residency programs also teaching addiction? And thank you very much. Um, so uh, w the biggest thing that I know as far as Georgetown, and I'll open it up to you guys too, because you may even know better better than myself as well. Um, the um, the addition of the buprenorphine training was a really large push within the medical school to address um, particularly opioid use disorder. Um, there are additional opportunities within the couple of years to expose medical students to um, addiction as well. I remember in my, um, in our first year or second year, we had a panel of addiction experts as well as um, a couple of patients who were in recovery who came to speak about their experiences. Um, and then we were all, um, required as part of our courses to attend an AA or NA me meeting um, to get that exposure. So um, there's certainly been efforts to include that. Do you guys have anything else to add as far as? I believe there's also a week, we are, we are second year students and Erica is a fourth year student. Um, so I believe there is a week in between the, um, the transition from your second year to your third year where we have a week focused on um, opioid opioid use um, and I believe they cover, cover some of those additional topics um, during that time as well. I'm not sure exactly of the content um, as far as in the residencies, I'm not sure as, on that as well. Thank you so much. So as I said, there will be naloxone available outside. We appreciate the medical students coming and uh, sharing their uh, interest in this issue. Uh, at the law school, we are working uh, to build partnerships with the medical center. Uh, we're actually going to have a law student, a, a medical student, who will be working with us at the at the law center uh, to kind of inform the work that we do on uh, opioid policies. And so. There, there is much more work that needs to be done and the medical center acknowledges uh, the, the work that they have done. I want to acknowledge and commend them for the work that they have done and also we look forward to working with them on further partnerships. Um, so now uh, next up is our fireside chat with uh, three folks I have a great admiration for. One is Michael Botticelli, who is currently with the Graken Center for Addiction at the Boston Medical Center, who also served in the Obama administration uh, as the director of national drug control policy. And I had the pleasure of working with Michael for a number of years. Um, and then Tracy Gardner, who is the Vice President of Policy Advocacy at the Legal Action Center, uh, and um, the Honorable Steve Williams, the Mayor of Huntington, West Virginia. We asked them to come today not only because they're great friends and allies, but also because they have an incredible perspective uh, to start to be the, the second speakers for the day to kick off and again to look beyond the, around the corner as to where they've been and what's coming 
next, and again, to move us from rescue to recovery. So I'd ask the three of you to come up and uh, be seated. Thank you. for that introduction. And just as a point of fact, uh, I carry my naloxone uh, with me wherever I go. Uh, we make it standard practice at Boston Medical Center to uh, distribute naloxone. So really honored to be here today uh, among uh, many friends and colleagues who've been doing this work for a long time. And I thought what I'd do is just say a little, a uh, um, couple framing comments and remarks, and then have a conversation with two folks who I've known for a long time who've also been engaged with this work and have some really interesting perspectives. So, you know, as I was thinking about comments today, you know, it occurred to me that it's really been about 20 years that we've been dealing with this epidemic. Really, you know, started, uh, uh, um, I think, this modern epidemic. You know, it started in the early 2000s with the dramatic of uh, overprescribing of prescription pain medication. And since that time, we've lost over 400,000 people in the United States, just staggering numbers that we have. And we know families and communities have been devastated uh, by this. You know, we've also seen uh, huge increases in people who have viral hepatitis, endocarditis, and outbreaks of HIV across the country, threatening to really erase decades of progress that we've made uh, in our fight against HIV. We also know that economic costs of this uh, epidemic have been enormous, and there is probably no sector of government, of business, or of society that hasn't been impacted by this. And I think we all also have come to understand uh, that the causes of this epidemic, and quite honestly, many uh, health issues, are, are not just about the specific drivers of the opioid epidemic, but are rooted in stigma and discrimination, poverty, racism, trauma, lack of vocational and educational opportunities, and social isolation, just to name a few. Um, and we also have to acknowledge, and many of us have been doing work in other arenas where we've had other stigmatized epidemics and stigmatized people before that I think can provide for us some kind of roadmap as we go forward. I think we also have to acknowledge that many of our communities of color have been impacted by this epidemic for a very, very long time uh, when our response to this was less uh, therapeutic and much more punitive. Um, but, but to move us to this theme of the conference, we, we do know that some parts of this country are making progress, largely driven by people's increased access to treatment as a function of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion, by the expansion of harm reduction services such as naloxone distribution and access to sterile syringe programs, uh, a retreat from arrest and incarceration, um, and active support from many within the law enforcement community. We've seen a much more visible and vocal recovery community and people willing to talk much more openly and honestly about how this impact has uh, affected them. But, but to pivot to really the theme of this conference, um, I have often invoked uh, a phrase that Dr. Nora Volkov, who's the director for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, talked about as our response to this epidemic. And it really is the fact that we actually do know what to do here. And our main function and the two biggest barriers are resources and will, right? So part of what I think we're here today to discuss is how do we move and implement all of those things we know to be effective with a sense of urgency um, where we can make more significant progress. Uh, even in my home state of Massachusetts, a state that has made some progress against opioid overdoses, we have cities that are still seeing significant increases in overdose death. So I think we also understand the importance of how do we drive some of the work that we're doing uh, at the local level. So, so with that, it really gives me great uh, pleasure to be with two folks who, uh, who uh, never have a shortage of things to say, um, uh, which is wonderful. So, uh, so I have an easy job at kind of moderating today. But, but I want to follow up on something that Regina talked about in terms of what brings us here today. So many of us have been doing this work for a long time across not only this epidemic, but other epidemics. And I, and I wanna start with kind of what, what have we learned so far? Where, where have we made progress? Um, and I think all of us understand it hasn't been urgent enough, hasn't been widespread enough, but, but where have we made progress in terms of, of how we have approached this epidemic? So Tracy, maybe I'll ask you to start here. Okay, so where we've made progress. Yep. Um, I think there's a greater, a greater understanding of 
addiction as a health issue. And mind you, I didn't say a disease. It's a health issue um, and it's been treated outside of the health system or what we understand to be the health system um, in a way that um, has put us behind. So <clears throat> you, we can't talk about where we are with the overdose epidemic without talking about racism because even though um, the, the perception is that um, we're taking a different tact because white people are affected, the, um, the broken system, the inattention to the system, the um, what I would say medieval thinking and approach to people who use drugs is what has created this atmosphere. And so that othering that happens, which is foundational in, in um, racism and, and the way that this country has sought to um, address its original sin and how it has permeated every single element of public policy that we can think of. So the more that we understand that this is, um, it's an epidemic, but it's also um, a highlight of what we've neglected. Um, HIV was that, a highlight of what we neglected. Everywhere that HIV emerges is usually where we, uh, a system has failed or we've responded in um, a, a one-off approach or um, that we don't bother to think through the consequences of um, public policy responses made in the midst of a, an emergency. That's great. Thanks, Tracy. Mayor? What, what I, obviously, I come from the public political sphere. Um, what I've come to learn among other mayors, uh, other legislators, um, is that, well, let's just, just state it for what it is. Ignoring a problem doesn't make it go away. And a lot of communities that you were referencing that are still starting to see the overdoses rising, we're thinking, we can't talk about this. Um, sometimes it's, we don't talk about this in polite conversation. Well, frankly, if we don't talk about it, how is that being polite? I mean, the, the reality is, is that if I have someone right next to me that is dying, I'm not going to turn my head and they're not going to die. Um, so what we've, what we've come to understand and what Regina was saying is to shift from um, saving people to restoring people towards recovery. It, this has been an interesting epiphany for me of, of, of late. Um, it's been sitting right there in front of me all of this time. Um, Mike, you, you remember very well in August of 2016, fentanyl arrived in Huntington. One afternoon we had 26 overdoses in a four hour period. Two people died because they shot up alone, um, but we had 24 people who lived because we had naloxone training for all of our first responders. I'll never forget, right after that happened, we were in Covington, Kentucky, and you came up to me and put your arms on my, my hands on my shoulders and just said, this is what we're here to do, to save people's lives. That was the shift that we made, because at first, communities were saying, arrest them, just arrest them. And we arrested 200 people in a 90-day period, and it continued, con continued on, on, ongoing. So we thought, we've got to save these people's lives. The, the, the problem was, of those 24 people who lived, not one person was referred to treatment. Not one. And it's taken, sadly, this long for this idiot to kind of catch up. But I came, to, I came to understand, it just hit me just a couple of months ago. Um, we saved someone from dying. We didn't save their life. When they go to recovery and advance through recovery, then we can say we're saving their life. We're saving their lives. 
that's become very, very personal for me, that we can't just save somebody from dying and say, done. That, that, that just doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, so where we've come is that cities, cities across America, through the leadership of mayors and others locally, are realizing this is something that we have to acknowledge, and in acknowledging it, say it for what it is. Say it for what it is. Um, and I'm, there's a, an ancient maxim, if you name it, you can own it. So say it for what it is. There are a lot of folks in Huntington that would have just assumed I had never said it because Huntington, sadly, has a stain on the name because people now try to say that Huntington is the epicenter of the heroin epidemic. Now, I hear that from a lot of other communities where they, they say that, and that just aggravates the living dog something out of me. Because, <laughs> but because I, I, you thought I was going to say it. Um, what we've come to realize, and this is where the leadership has to occur, is that we're not the epicenter of the epidemic, we're the epicenter of the solution to the epidemic. And then that starts to translate it to all sorts of other things because it's not just heroin, it's also fentanyl, it's meth, it's, it's addiction, it's not just an opioid epidemic. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, for, for those folks familiar with the 12-step world, I think it's kind of oddly coincidental that uh, acceptance is the first step on the path to recovery. So I think, uh, um, uh, I think you say that that, that exists. That point, cities are in recovery That's too. Right. I That's keep right. saying to folks in, a, in our community, there are individuals who are in recovery and our city is in recovery. That's, I, I'm seeing that as a very positive sign as to we're not looking as to what's happened in the past, it's what we have occurring for us in front of us and in the future. You know, I also want to point out, I remember that day very vividly when we heard about the fentanyl outbreak and how frustrating it was at the federal policy level to basically have two-year-old data systems in terms of understanding not only kind of, and I often say, you know, it's hard to look around the corner when all you have is a rear view mirror. Um, and so part of it, not really discussion today is, but I think part of our overall response to the opioid epidemic was how do we even improve our data gathering Imagine systems. Somebody throwing a pitch and you swing two innings and later. And two innings later, so, so I did do that. It's I, really important that we unpack, and I don't wanna undermine the whole point of the conference, but recovery needs to be unpacked, yeah. right? Our insistence that recovery is abstinence is also what's killing people. Um, recovery is whatever you say it is, whatever you mean um, it is that will um, save your life. And you know, you and I have come up where harm reduction was this dirty word and um, people are, harm reduction is about love and it's about caring and it's about valuing the life of um, a person who uses drugs. We're barely out of the realm of thinking where people think that the best um, antidote to active addiction is that someone dies because they're thought to never quote unquote recover, to never stop. And our understanding of what it means for people who use drugs problematically, and that's the other thing, it's just like alcoholism, the alcoholics, the problematic alcoholics make up a small percentage of the people who actually drink and the people who are struggling with substance use disorder are a small percentage of the people who use drugs. Um, refusing to acknowledge sex and drugs has gotten us into trouble over and over again. So, right, name it, be real about it, own it, and then you can do an intervention. But if you pretend that that's not what's going on, or even worse, that those other people are out there having quote unquote unsafe sex, those other people are out there using drugs. There are no others, it is you, it is happening and I think that's one of the main lessons of uh, this generation of um, a drug epidemic is showing us there is no other. So, so, so let me follow up on, on that because I think it's really important 
that, you know, we know that there is this huge gap um, in terms of our understanding of what is effective and promising, right? So you just talked about harm reduction programs being tremendously effective. We know that there are many, many things that we can do, but there is this huge gap between kind of what we know to be effective and, and implementation, right? Right. And right. so, you know, one, one of the things that, you know, I, I've come to understand and people have heard me say this before is that science and data don't drive public policy, nope. unfortunately, right? Um, so, so how do we, from your perspective, what are the other levels, levers at our disposal if science and evidence are not gonna move people to implementing all the things we know to be effective? What are the other tools at our disposal um, that we can kind of move and kind of apply what we know and enact what we know with a greater sense of urgency? Um, you know, uh, and y you could certainly talk at the national level uh, around kind of some of the legal work. You know, Mayor, you had the challenge of how do I do this at a local level? Right. But, but it's, um, and we were having this conversation a little earlier, um, it's what you said, political will. What does political will mean? Political will means that the, art the priority is articulated and implemented in such a way that um, things happen. I have never believed there's not enough money. There's always money. It's always about priorities or and what informs what the priority will be. Right now, we are prioritizing people with opioids. We will have to prioritize people who use stimulants. <laughs> we will have to prioritize, you know what I mean? And so, um, and that is um, a, a huge mistake that we should do a real deep full stop on. If we keep talking about opioids, we're already perpetuating a dual duality of systems where if you can't be addressed by the three FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder, you're out of luck. And that's, that's ridiculous. The other thing um, element here that I've seen and experienced is when the executive decides it's a priority, I don't care if it's the county health official or uh, but the mayor, the governor, or the president, that's when things happen. I love my legislatures, but um, it's really the executive mandate that can the make things move. The committee has never Not solved anything. A task force. I love my, last, I love my legislators, state and federal. I have yet to find them ever solve anything, <laughs> ever. Whether my party's in, in power or not, they don't solve things. There are, in the Congress, there's 535, there's one president. In a state legislature there, how in West Virginia, there's 134, there's one governor. In my city, we have 11 council members, there's one mayor. Who's gonna make the decision? The mayor, a governor, maybe, and a president, we'll see. But the thing is, is that it gets down to really at the local level. You know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery. Minor's when you're having it. Major surgery's when I'm having it. <laughs> it's a major problem when it's in my backyard, when it's in my town. And Folks, finally, you're asking about the willingness to step forward when it's sitting there right in front of them and just staring at them. They can't, they, they just can't look any other way. Hell's bells, that's how I ended up facing it. I, again, I thought it was a policing problem. Right. And there was one morning when I came in, we had a raid on a house. 500 grams of heroin had been delivered to this house the evening before, and I was told we're gonna to have a raid at 8 a.m. Asked me to come in to observe that raid. Um, we thought that we had a big score. After our SWAT team went in, there was only 35 grams of heroin left in the house. 465 grams had been distributed and I started doing some research to figure out, well, how many people is this affecting? One-tenth of a gram goes into a needle for a, uh, for a hit. 
So that meant 4,650 hits were being delivered. There were thousands of people in my community then that I saw the extent of, of the problem then. That's when I realized we have to do something. If we were waiting on others, you know, people were coming up to me, you've heard the story, saying, Mayor, we, we're losing our neighborhood. Mayor, please, you have to do something. Frankly, that's where if, if this, whether it's the opioid epidemic or whatever else, the epidemic of addiction is going to be addressed when the decisions are being made at the local level. It doesn't necessarily have to be a mayor. It could be someone in the community that's standing up and saying, somebody needs to do something and that's me. Now, who's going to stand by me on, on addressing this? Um, there are no lack of resources. There are no lack of resources. I, I, <laughs> listen, when, when we get money. when we, in in my office, what I what I've said at the very first day that I've been in office in the seven years since is that don't ever come in and start saying, well, we don't have the money. Exactly. Money's tight everywhere. Get over it. Mm -hmm. That's why I've hired you. Use your brain to figure out how to get there. And if you're saying I, the only way I'm going to do it is this, if we're going to have additional money, then you're not as smart as I thought you were to, to, to begin with. And it's amazing where we have found there are resources hiding in plain sight in yeah. every community. The people who are sitting there, there are individuals who are being repurposed, still have the same jobs. I created our own Office of Drug Control Policy. I saw what you were doing. I went, I want to do that. <laughs> and we created our own, but I didn't hire anybody new. I just reassigned them to do other things. And there are people hiding in plain sight. There was one lady that was sitting in our fire department who was also a nurse working in the emergency room. She, she was a captain in the fire department. She had been part of the fire department for 20 years, not, not really active in anything. She became a deputy chief. Now she's the first fire chief, female fire chief, in the history of the city and the history of the state. And Jan Rader was named one of the time 100 most influential people in the world. It's not out there. Hell's bells. She was sitting right there in Huntington, West Virginia. <laughs> the, the, it's right there, just waiting to be called upon. But you made it happen. Uh, you made the, the it happen. Made it happen. Well, the community made it happen. Well, the community got in your face and <laughs> said, you better do something. And that's part of what we're talking about. I mean, it sounds kind of lame when people say, well, what you got to do is you got to vote. But a lack of civic engagement is also what has gotten us here because people don't give a crap. I'm like, it's not what I was going to say it, right? <laughs> they don't give a crap. They think that it doesn't... Um, that there will be no impact if we tell Mayor Williams this is happening. And nothing could be further from the truth, right? Even in this day of, of, of social media, um, there is nothing like the direct engagement and really flying in the face of the apathy that policymakers think is in the electorate, right? Elections, I don't want to talk about national election, but state and, and local elections are, are, the difference can be a block or two. So um, the other thing I want to put out, because people are like, what, you're going to be on a panel with somebody from West Virginia? How's that going to go? Well, that, no, <laughs> because the, the issues are the same. Anywhere you go, you are going to find some of the same um, uh, kind of poor thinking, right? Anywhere you go, I'll bet your quote unquote mental hygiene system is separate from your health system. I'll bet that your health system um, will and has up until recently been sending or bringing in law enforcement. Um, we have siloed in a way that is going to really, really keep us sick. And so why we have systems that deal with mental health, that deal with substance use disorder, that deal with physical health, it's the same person. 
but we have different policy, different systems, different funding. So unless there's enough funding for mental health, somehow that's gonna take away from funding for addiction, which is stupid. It's the same person. Now, some people have only one issue, and um, which is rare, actually. Um, there are very few people that have only one issue. So how do we address the systemic um, fracture in order to um, really, I, I know, the, the word holistic isn't right, but or is tired, but unless we do that, it's not gonna work. We learned that in HIV, that we wanted to think it was just about prevention intervention. We were just gonna talk about sex, but then things started growing, oh, well, they need to be housed, or we need more primary care, or we need to uh, integrate, we need to co-locate, we need to, and there we started building a whole new healthcare system um, that started in response to HIV. But yet and still, we are still in this place where um, folks of color, particularly um, uh, sexual quote unquote minorities, aren't, aren't in the 2020 year of HIV as a chronic manageable disease. And so again, I warn that unless we look more comprehensively, we're going to create bifurcated systems and it is going to perpetuate the inequalities that already exist. One other thing, I don't wanna hear anymore, these are all the things that Tracy doesn't wanna hear anymore, social determinants of health is a way of saying people have messy lives and that they can't prioritize health the way that health wants to. See, my contention or is that health relinquished its responsibility to address addiction. It relinquished it. It said, we're not gonna deal with those people and allowed or relegated people to the criminal justice system, which said, okay, we'll, we'll deal with it, but we're gonna do a crappy job at it. And because we don't have the money that health has. So now we're figuring out all of these innovative models of um, bringing together criminal justice and health and looking at the Medicaid law and seeing like, really, we're not treating people before they leave prison and jail? And, and all of this stuff we're rethinking. But there is plenty of blame to spread around, but there's also plenty of opportunity. And so um, social determinants of health is just um, people, people who live real lives and who have to prioritize their health as well as other elements of their lives. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will say as a large safety net institution, it's really interesting when your payment and delivery system uh, basically only reimburses you for a thing that you do when we thoroughly understand that what drives poor health for our patients at BMC are things like unstable housing and history of trauma in their communities right. and lack of access to care um, uh, and uh, their immigration status uh, are all issues that are important. So, so let me pivot to that because I think it's important as we start thinking around the corner that I, those of us who have been doing this work, Tracy, you articulated one of them, that this epidemic, I think, really exacerbated and pointed to longstanding structural issues that were wrong with our system to begin with. Uh, you pointed to one of them, and that was the lack of integration or the siloing of addiction treatment. Um, one can say largely to a criminal justice system, but marginally to a separate a treatment system. So you talked about kind of the integration. If, if we're gonna make enduring progress on not just the opioid epidemic, but I think we all see stimulants coming around the corner for which we don't have FDA approved medica medications. I wanna ask you either at the national level, Mayor, you've been talking about this at the local level, what are the structural things or what are the big things that we need to make sure get addressed in terms of those systemic issues if we're gonna make some enduring progress on not only the evolution of this uh, epidemic, but kind of addressing this as we going forward? Well, I'll just say very quickly that some of it is happening, which is we are, um, um, make no mistake that we are also reaping the quote unquote rewards of this 40 year you know, war on drugs, right? We've established whole systems that basically have been influenced by that enormous public policy. So some of it is going to looking at where the really um, systemic barriers are and unpacking them. 
Um, one of the issues that we're working on at Legal Action Center has to do with Medicaid is 55 years old and there's a Medicaid law that keeps people who are incarcerated from getting um, Medicaid coverage and not one person I've talked to around this country um, everyone has told a tale of individuals leaving the correctional setting coming back home because they almost always do and having no health care, having no Medicaid coverage when they're coming back out. And unless they hit the lotto when they were inside, they qualify and can be covered for Medicaid. But we have this baked in um, dysfunction that says, Ooh, we can't let them steal health care. And so we have people um, coming out without a safety net and walking into in, uh, walking into death now with this overdose epidemic, people are leaving the correctional setting and overdosing at rates much higher than anywhere else. What is the fix? Oh, that we're going to build these new systems to create and and do in reach into jails? No, just remove the restriction um, for this particular reentry population. Simple, easy. Again, a president could do it. Executive order. Or Congress could do it, but there needs to be, you know, kind of cutting away of the, oh, but we can't, we can't, the special interests, the insurance companies, whatever. If it's an epidemic, if people are dying, then let's approach it that way. That's an example of some of the, look at what we put into place in 40 years that does not work anymore in the last 40 years, and get rid of it or unpack it or repurpose it. Thanks. Uh, um, I do have to comment that's assuming that we have a Medicaid system that still covers people. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Mayor, you talked about this before, right? So how do you make enduring changes in Huntington so that, you know, you have a much more kind of resilient community, um, not only in terms of moving from kind of rescue to recovery, as Gina talked about, Regina talked about, but uh, in terms of, you know, kind of creating a sense of kind of community and vibrancy so that you're, you're protected from, from the next potential epidemic. When we first started discussing in, in, this, in this conversation, uh, we were talking about will, um, breaking down silos. Mm -hmm. um, as I started talking with different groups, I mean, I have, my, I have no background in any of this. I'm, I'm a finance guy. I was a stockbroker. Um, I didn't, uh, to, to come in to, to this, uh, as I indicated at the very beginning, I thought it was a law enforcement um, problem. But as I came to become more, uh, more aware, everything was siloed. Everything was siloed. The health department was off on its own. Uh, the state was off on their own. We had behavioral health programs off on, on, on their own. Um, Faith-based community was off on its, its own. Law enforcement was out just, or just arresting people. Um, within the prisons, when they would come out, when the prisoner would come out there, they were right in that system, but they came out and nothing had been done to address any issues of, of addiction. Um, what we came to, to understand is that we had to have everybody. Um, you, were, you were there when, with some of what I was, I was saying, is that I became just very adamant of wherever I would go to speak is that everybody had to understand everyone had an assignment. Mm -hmm. Everyone had an assignment. And everybody in once having that assignment, people needed to talk with one another. Collaboration led to partnerships. As you started to partner, you, you created trust. It's a very simple formula. Collaboration, partnerships, and trust equal hope. Hope. Hope isn't a strategy. It's, it's an, an outcome. So I speak in things in a very simplistic way, but what I was seeing is when people were saying, somebody needs to do something, I said, well, look in the mirror. <laughs> you, have, you have something to, to add. And, and what's been absolutely fascinating is that 
Now the medical school is talking to the hospitals. <laughs> the Radical. pharmacy school is talking to the medical school. Uh, the, the health department is talking to the police department. Right down the road from us, we had created the first harm reduction program in the state of West Virginia. Right down the road in our capital city, they came in and created a harm reduction program, but nobody was talking to one another. When they were running into issues, then the harm reduction program got shut down in Charleston. We found a way, it's not perfect by any means, but you have to constantly be reviewing, evaluating, and adjusting constantly. So when our police officers were encountering an increase in, uh, in needle litter, uh, they brought the health department in, let's talk about this. And we'd go on a raid and we'd call the medical director and he'd come walking in to what we were walking into and seeing all the the needles all around that were coming from the syringe exchange program. Well, we made some adjustments. Now the medical director goes in and there are Sharpies can, Sharpie cans where the sharps are, the needles are, and he can, he can tell. And now when they're bringing the syringes or the needles back in for an exchange, more are being brought in than are actually being delivered. Mm -hmm. So Lao Tzu wrote, and I'll butcher this, but when a leader's job is completed, when the aim is fulfilled, the people say, look what we did for ourselves. That's the key to the leadership. What I'm, I'm most frustrated with is uh, in 2017, uh, the president announced a state of national health emergency regarding the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest existential threat facing our nation, period. Greater than terrorism, greater than a wall. It involves foreign relations. It involves criminal justice system. It involves the healthcare system. It involves workforce development. It involves the economy. It involves everything, exactly what you were saying. It is not all of these things. It's everything. Yeah, but they hear it better when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> but let me follow, let me, well, let me follow well, up I'll on say, that. I, you know, I think, you know, I think you talk quite passionately about you know, that this has to be a multi-sector response. Yes. Like every, every part of our community and every part needs to be engaged here. So, so who's been missing, right? Are there sectors, um, not necessarily in Huntington, but as you kind of travel around the there, country? There are in are, Huntington. Are, are, there, are there sectors, and Tracy, you can reflect on this. Are there sectors um, that you wish, um, who are really dramatically late to the table here? Um, and who haven't really kind of stepped forward in a meaningful way. Who has stepped way. forward, who surprised me amazingly, we had this conversation when we first met, is the faith community has stepped in, in, in a major way in, in Huntington. We have a quick response team, and when we, 24 to 72 hours, when we go to talk to the person who is overdosed to try to help them get, uh, to get uh, treatment, we have, uh, we have a police officer, we have the EMT, we have, uh, uh, we have a recovery coach, and we have a pastor sitting there. Some people are just saying, I don't want to talk about that religious stuff. Um, that's fine. Then the pastor's there for the others. Um, but what's that one day when we had 24 people that, uh, that uh, over or 26 people that overdosed, the 24 people that never made it to treatment uh, or any attempt to, to treatment. Um, now, one third of the people who were going to, it's still much lower than what we want, but one third versus zero? Um, you know, so the, the faith community has been, has, has stepped up in, in, in a major way, but the faith community also gets in the way 
get that's, I mean, it, that is, talk about bifurcated. There's some that's just say, I don't care. I really don't care what your faith tradition is. Just love one another. Right. Compassion. Compassion. But we're also seeing there's a level of compassion fatigue. When a community says, says let them die, mm -hmm. well, then that's telling me we are a very compassionate community. When, when people are so fed up, you know, we have received grants from the Bloomberg Foundation and others to address compassion fatigue among our first responders because it's not just, we, we've talked an awful lot about helping those who need to go to recovery. Good God, I have to take care of my, my firefighters and my EMT workers and our, and our police officers, what they see day in and day out, the level of trauma that they're experiencing. Again, this is the greatest existential threat facing our nation. I just want to say, and I don't know if it's who's missing, but it's an element that's missing that we don't like to talk about, you know, kind of bootstraps and yeah, everybody, boots, boots and right, exactly. You have to have a pair of boots if you're going to bootstrap it. We, we, we need to use some money. We need to use money to incentivize or support people in being able to do the right thing. A lot of this is presumed of the goodness of their heart, the responsibility of the public sector. We need, we're a capitalist society. So if we're really capitalist, people need to be paid. The example that comes to mind, as you mentioned, Bloomberg, is what you pay in, at the beginning nets you so much more in terms of a savings. Um, mayor Bloomberg, when he was mayor in New York City, actually floated the idea of paying people to eat well or paying people to, you know, for these things that society believes, no, you should just do on your own. If we paid individuals who use drugs to get those syringes, there would be no community syringes. There would be no um, uh, needle sticks. That idea, remember back in the day when we thought needle exchange is going to encourage drug use, and that did not bear out. I would love to see someone actually put their money where their mouth is and put some money into people's pockets to incentivize them to do the quote-unquote right things. I think you would see radical changes. So, so we only have uh, a minute left. <laughs> I'm saying that. I'm looking at you, Mayor Williams. Yeah. Um, the legend so continues. So th those of us who've been doing kind of health-related work for a long time, you know, thoroughly understand that you have a crisis, lots of attention, lots of money, light, uh, lots of resources. Um, we make a little bit of progress, and then all the attention and all the urgency goes away. Right. Right? So in a very short couple sentences, <laughs> for a very big issue, how do we maintain a sense of urgency uh, on this issue so that we're not just making a little bit of progress? Why must it be urgent versus we take a completely different generational mindset? I know it's not accomplishable. We won't see it. But we have to stop dwelling and working in the acute and start doing more preventative and start doing more that's health promotion. We would not be here if um, that were the approach all along. So the closest we've gotten to it are some elements of ACA, right? I, I gotta talk about my president. But that is as close as we've come and look how fraught that is. So I would like us to stop being in urgency and to start um, having a mindset and a policy approach to health promotion. Thank you. Mayor? Boldness has genius and mad magic in it. Give permission to, for people to be bold. Great. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our, our panelists for all the work. Today. <laughs> you did good. You did good. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. That was really wonderful and, and sets uh, a lot of the tone for the day. Um, 
So a uh, couple reminders, housekeeping things. Um, we have a break now until 10.30. If you're on the next panel, we ask you to come uh, back here about five minutes early so you can get mic'd up. Um, uh, the elevators, if you don't want, so the coffee break will be held where you signed in. Um, you can go all the way down and take the elevators to the fourth floor if you don't want to go up all those steps. Um, and the hashtag for today is GU Addiction Policy, if you are tweeting. Uh, and also, lastly, I want to thank Business for Impact for helping us with this event and also with this wonderful venue. They have, this is the business school. It's awfully nice. We're very happy to be here. Uh, so we'll see you back here at 1030 to discuss uh, medications to treat opioid use disorder in correctional institutions. Thanks.
Okay, and uh, again, just a reminder, if you have questions to go to the mics that um, were in the center aisles that I'm sure will be put back there at some point. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lippy Roy. Good morning, everyone. So, um, uh, th thank you, Regina and the entire team for putting this together in this beautiful venue. I made a joke about how um, m medical schools never look as nice as business schools, so it's nice to be in a really pretty facility. Um, uh, can folks hear me in the back? Hope so, yes, excellent. Um, so. The alarming number of overdose deaths driven mostly by opioids has clearly become a public health epidemic. This health crisis has disproportionately impacted uh, incarcerated men and women, among whom over 50% experience a substance use disorder. And even though life-saving medications exist, an egregiously no, low number of uh, correctional facilities offer any type of evidence-based treatment. Um, a couple of years ago, I was the, uh, the former uh, chief of addiction medicine for New York City jails, including Rikers Island, and among the many lessons that I learned, one of them was, if you weren't traumatized before you got to Rikers, you sure as heck will be once you get there, no matter what side of the bar you're on, a correction officer or um, somebody who's actually behind bars. Uh, the other lesson that I learned very quickly is that over 50% of the men and women there had some type of a substance use disorder and very few of them were receiving treatment. Although I will say Rikers Island is one of the very few facilities that offered uh, uh, evidence-based treatment including methadone, buprenorphine, as well as uh, mental health counseling and substance use counseling. So all of you are really in for a treat for this uh, this morning's panel uh, titled Saving Lives, Access to Medications to Treat Opioid Use Disorder in Correctional Institutions and Recovery, uh, and Reentry, pardon me. So I'm gonna give a, the way this is gonna be structured, I'm gonna give a really brief one-liner intro to each of the speakers. You can read about their uh, very impressive bios in your handouts. And then each uh, speaker will have 10 minutes to share their thoughts uh, and their areas of expertise. Uh, first, to my left is uh, Sheriff Craig Apple. He's been the Sheriff of Albany County since 2011, previously a corrections officer and investigator. You can read more in his bio. Uh, Ms. Beth Connolly is Project Director, Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Initiatives for the Pew Charitable Trusts. Next to Beth is Tara Kunkel. She's a Senior Policy Advisor with the U.S. Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. Next to Tara is Mr. Jeff Locke, Program Director, National Governors Association Center for Best Practices at the Homeland Security and Public Safety Division. That's a real mouthful, Jeff, as a title. Um, holy cow. <laughs> this is coming from somebody who also has the title of Director of Addiction Medicine and Community Engagement. <laughs> Crazy. And last but most certainly not least is Mr. Michael White, who's the Director of Community Programs, Community Medical Services. So um, we're going to start off with um, the sheriff speaking. Um, good morning. Um, as Dr. Roy indicated, I'm Craig Apple. I'm from Albany County Sheriff's up in Albany, New York. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to, uh, to come down. It's always a pleasure to get out and talk about some of the great things happening um, up in our correctional facility. A few years back, we noticed um, a drastic increase in opioid um, overdose deaths, um, overdoses, and um, we, we needed to do something. We needed to sit back and figure out and come up with a new game plan. And um, to just regress a little bit, Albany County has a 1,040 bed facility, a correctional facility, um, which is somewhat disproportionately crazy when you look at the size of our county. So we always had the philosophy of just lock up those who are um, using drugs, dealing drugs, whatever the case may be, throw them in jail and them sort it out. And, um, you know, obviously that uh, methodology has failed. So we needed to come up with a new way, something innovative that we can do here to try to change this and keep people from coming back. So in 2015, we created what we call the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program. I'm an acronym guy, so we call it our SHARP program. And um, right off the bat, we started to interview in inmates coming in and asking them if, uh, if they were addicted, if they used opioids and if they wanted to have um, a shot at a clean and healthy and productive life. So on day one, we filled the wing. 
and um, we had some treatment providers that come in. We had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer counseling. We have our own case acts. And we've um, put roughly 400 people through that to date. And we use a recidivism rate um, roughly of about 14 to 16 percent. It, it varies day to day depending on um, releases and admissions. But relatively, you know, a third of what uh, most uh, county correctional facilities recidivism rate is. So um, this is working great. We used a product called Vivitrol, which I was a fan of. I thought this was going to be the new miracle drug to stop um, you know, uh, those coming in that are uh, afflicted with addiction. And it never really got, um, it never took off. It just kind of was stuck in the mud. So over the course of the years, I was beaten down with emails from some of our treatment providers to, um, to get involved in medically assisted treatment. So we started to um, dispense Suboxone, buprenorphine, and uh, naltroxone, uh, methadone. And um, we've put roughly 253 people through our program to date. Um, we have 40 in the jail currently on it with a recidivism rate of about 6%. So um, there's a few misnomers out there, and I'm going to try to talk fast so we can get the other speakers through and, and open it up for questions, because this program, we've been able to do, um, well, first of all, with the assistance of um, our New York State Oasis, which you'll hear from one of the speakers this afternoon, Bob Kent, um, who has been a blessing to our program to always kind of um, reappropriate some funds to keep this thing going. And to date, we've expended roughly $65,000. So if you look at $65,000 in drugs to, um, to keep 253 people out of jail and clean compared to $66,000 per head annual cost of incarceration, it's really a no-brainer. And um, we've proven this concept in New York. Um, we're hoping it spreads. I think we were the first outside of Rikers Island to, um, to establish it. And now I know that there's other counties, there's legislation, there's a lot of things um, happening in New York to um, hopefully get medically assisted treatment out there. I was against it at first in total transparency. Um, I just had a hard time accepting this in a correctional facility, knowing that I always had Suboxone smuggled, um, smuggled in the facility, methadone smuggled in the facility, and I've seen people overdose on it. People get, um, you know, if, if somebody knows they have it, they could, they could get shivved, whatever the case may be. But um, fortunately, you know, um, again, through basically being worn down with some of the advocates in the community, we switched to it. And I, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm kind of sorry that I didn't do it earlier, and I wonder how many more lives we could have changed if we had done a humane approach with the medically assisted treatment. So um, it's up and running, I think, Oasis every day for it. And a lot of our other providers um, in the area with Conifer Park and Catholic Charities, who does wonderful work with us, uh, we've been able to turn that facility into um, a really great facility, releasing inmates that can go out and live that life that we all live every day and take for granted. Um, and we've even involved to our final phase of we've just opened up a homeless shelter in the jail with some of the open space that we have. So inmates getting out that have um, nowhere to go, that have been fighting addiction and lost everything they have, we can now let them out the front door and basically come over around to the other side of the jail where they have their own room and we can work with them on getting job skills training, com, um, mental health counseling, f still in recovery, whatever the case may be, we have um, programs up and running. So uh, it's been some, there's been some really good things happening up there. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. That was really remarkable, the work that's happening in Albany County. We're going to have an opportunity to talk more about this, but uh, I'd like to move on to, uh, I think Beth is next. Thanks, Beth. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the O'Neill Institute for hosting this really great day. Um, I'm, we're really excited to be here. Uh, I'm with Pew Charitable Trust, and we're a nonpartisan research and policy organization. Uh, through partnerships like that with the Bloomberg Philanthropies, we were able to go into states and provide technical assistance around um, reducing overdose deaths due to the opioid epidemic. Um, I was thinking about some of the data that's out there, um, definitely about, as Dr. Roy mentioned, that uh, people involved in the criminal justice system are um, so disproportionately impacted. And one of the statistics that you may have heard is that in 2017, 47,000 people died of um, an opioid overdose. And I was trying to put that in context in my head. and. Um, and it seemed timely as watching the World Series, and I heard that uh, the capacity and the attendance at one of the Nats World Series games was 46,000. Mm -hmm. And as you looked across the stadium, as I was watching on TV, because I certainly wasn't there, um, I thought you'd have to put a thousand more people like in the infield, and all of those people died in one year. And it was just really staggering to me when I saw those people sitting there, like how much that really hit home. 
So um, thank you, Cheryl, for your uh, great intro because um, you are a convert to medication for addiction treatment, which is fantastic. Um, and some of the work that we're doing at Pew really is trying to bring people who have been converted um, into understanding what medications can do for people. And um, so as someone like you is so important to our work. I want to give you a little um, bit of information about a particular project we're working on now because it's really at the, the starting point. Um, and so we're very hopeful, but um, really about how we're going through this process. So, and full disclosure, I am the former commissioner of human services for the state of New Jersey, um, and I'm going to talk about New Jersey, but it's not necessarily because of that. It just happens to be where we're working right now. Um, so, a couple of years ago, uh, New Jersey started uh, to bring substance use treatment into the prison uh, system. So, the whole state prison system was bringing medications into the system for um, people with opioid use disorder. And uh, this was really great. Uh, we were very proud of it. Um, as the years have passed now, what the prison system is seeing is that as people are go through the judicial process into the jails, they're only getting a handful of people that have any substance use treatment when they actually get into the state prison system. Because if you're familiar, pretty much people do not go from being arrested directly into a state prison system. They have an interim step that they're often in um, a county jail system. So we've been asked to go into New Jersey and help to bring medications into the county jail systems. And there's 19 in New Jersey. And they're all, they're very different. Some are very um, open and are actually using medications in the system. And others are, you know, trying to figure it out, not understanding, you know, why the importance, not understanding the importance of three medications and not just one medication that's readily or easily available to many systems. So this is um, you know, sort of our effort right now, and we're looking at it across a system. So when we think about um, treatment, we think about a continuum of care in the community, but really we can translate that into a continuum of care in the judicial system. So where are people coming into the system and what is the care that they're getting so that as they progress through the criminal justice system, either from jail into back into the community or from jail to prison to back into the community, what are those pieces that need to be in place to make sure that people can be successful and receive the treatment that they need. So some of the things that we're working on is, number one, is access to treatment within each facility. And what will that look like for each facility? We know, and if you think about your own counties, the counties in New York, the counties in the states where you all come from, um, different size jails, you know, different complement of staff. How is it that we can help to formulate what kinds of uh, medical staff assessments, treatments will be needed in order to address it, no matter what the size of the population is in each jail? From there, um, what uh, protocols are needed to be instilled into the system so that the um, medications can be administered appropriately? One of the things that New Jersey realized when they did this in their prison system is, as um, Michael referred to earlier, the stigma that was really involved. And it was really pervasive across the staff in the system. So not understanding what medications were, not really understanding that substance use disorder is a chronic brain disease and needs to be treated like diabetes or like hypertension. And so education of the staff became really important because it wouldn't be successful at the state prison system if folks were not really understanding what they were doing and why they were doing it and the importance of doing what they were doing. So this education component is going to be another key portion of what we bring to the county jail system. In New Jersey, they have bail reform, one of the first states to actually implement, fully implement bail reform, which means that for them, 91% of the folks entering the jail system are there for 48 hours or less. So how do we structure a program so that folks that are coming in and leaving so quickly back into the community are either starting treatment or being connected if they're going out very quickly? Um, and this, you know, talking about our continuum of care means in educating not only the folks inside about, 
moving people through quickly, but also how are you making these connections back into the community? Again, going back to stigma, we can have a lot of providers in the community, but there is also stigma in the provider community. Some folks are not ready, willing, or able to work with folks coming from the criminal justice system and how do we educate and work with them. So working with the state's behavioral health system, um, their behavioral health department, in ensuring that there are providers out there ready when folks are coming in back into the community, especially as they so rapidly churn. Uh, another critical piece in moving in back into the community is Medicaid. Um, so a payer, so connecting folks with Medicaid, ensuring that states, um, and New Jersey is one of these states, that does not stop Medicaid when folks enter, that it's put on hold so that folks can transition easily back onto their Medicaid benefit in order to receive treatment. Um, the last part of our project, um, which we're very excited, and hopefully next year, um, O'Neill Institute will do this again, and I can talk about some of the data. So Johns Hopkins University will actually be evaluating our project. Um, they've started with us right from day one, so collecting some great baseline data, and um, so hopefully next year we can talk about some of the great things that we're seeing. Um, I'll turn it over. So thanks, Beth. Pew Charitable Trust has been doing excellent work. I cite their, their reports and their data all the time, so thank you, Beth, for sharing that. Um, Tara is next, looking forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Um, good morning, my name is Tara Kunkel. I'm a Senior Drug Policy Advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. If you're not familiar with BJA, we're one of the primary funders for sheriffs, um, law enforcement, and all parts of the criminal justice system. I oversee the Comprehensive Opioid Abuse Program, which is a major grant program. Um, this year we awarded $187 million in funding, um, and a great deal of that funding went to support medication-assisted treatment. Um, I'm gonna borrow Michael's phrase of will and resources and, and start there. Um, and I wanna say, uh, start with will. Um, so over the three years of administering the grant program, what I have observed in my role is a, a change in interest on the parts of jail administrators in introducing MAT, and particularly all three forms of MAT into their jails. Um, last year was just an amazing year in terms of interest. Um, and applications and requests for technical assistance in this area. And I think that's in part, and I, I really have to acknowledge the stakeholder associations that work with sheriffs in stepping up and offering more educational programming in this area, providing more information um, about potential lawsuits, um, sharing information about technical assistance. I really wanna acknowledge and recognize the National Sheriff's Association, ACA, major county sheriffs, for all of the work that they're doing um, to really make information about MAT accessible to their stakeholder. Um, states are passing legislation, as you know, um, requiring MAT in jails. I think that's also contributing to the interest. And I think, frankly, sheriffs are making this a priority. Um, they are making this um, a decision in their budget, uh, a decision philosophically, a decision as part of their campaign to introduce um, this as a form of treatment. Out of this will, I think, has emerged two groups, um, a group that is ready. Um, their community is already ready and organized to introduce MAT into jails, and um, that's an easy group for BJA to work with. We offer grants, so they step up and they write a grant. We have a lot of funding in this area. Um, we currently fund 45 projects in our traditional site-based grant program, um, primarily in jails, some prison projects, but mostly our work is in jails. Um, so that group that's already organized and ready, they're a pretty easy group for us. I think the challenge and our focus right now is on the second group um, that has the will, but needs some work in terms of capacity building and building relationships with stakeholders. Um, so to that end, we introduced a demonstration project this last year. We partnered with Arnold Ventures, um, and we put out a solicitation um, that we called a shorthand um, term for it. We called it the Bridges Project. And what we offered was um, technical assistance, intense technical assistance for nine months. We ultimately selected 16 communities, but we offered intense technical assistance, which included monthly coaching, convening the 16 sites together for a peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange um, twice over the course of the project. We've had one convening, the second one will be in January. Um, and we really wanted these 16 communities um, to just have a period of time where they focused on 
How do I introduce um, three forms of MAT into my jail? That was a requirement of the funding. But also, how do I get this reentry piece right? I was a former probation officer, and so I share the perspective that it's really important what happens in jails, but it's also really important when you leave jails. And to your point about the rapid cycling in and out of jails, um, they're going to pretty quickly often go into a pretrial um, program. They're going to go into some potentially a drug court or other kind of court supervision model, or they're going to go to probation. So getting that piece right was a major part of the project that we're doing the Bridges Projects with AV. So what have we learned um, from the 16 sites so far? Um, in fact, I think we've learned that the jail piece may be the easiest part, like getting the correctional health piece set up to actually be able to deliver three forms um, is um, important, um, but it hasn't been the biggest challenge um, for the sites. I think the sites have mostly spoken about the challenge about reentry. When you're dealing in a jail where people are moving in and out so quickly, how do you communicate with all the system players um, um, and get that person connected to a community-based provider and also make sure that if they're going to any sort of criminal justice community-based supervision, that they're on board philosophically, that they're supportive, um, that they're not placing conditions on them that might restrict um, the continuation of their medication or impede their ability to access medication just um, through through accidental conditions. So I think that is a, a piece that we see the 16 communities really wrestling with. Um, and it's exciting to be a part of those discussions. I think the second thing that has emerged is a need for really practical, tangible products um, that, can, that they can pick up and understand um, what to do with. So they don't need to be convinced this is a good idea. So the kinds of things that they're asking for, I got a call from a judge last week who said, I have funding um, available from a funder, but I have two weeks to put together a budget, and I don't know what uh, a comprehensive jail-based plus community-based project cost. Um, help me figure out a budget. Like, where do I even start? And this was a judge who made this call. So having a template that gives somebody a sense of the kinds of items that they should include in a budget is not something I thought about before the project started that's really practical and needed. Um, Contracts, sample contracts um, has been a very hot topic. So can I have a template um, for my correctional health RFP um, that says these are the services that should be delivered? And the same question goes for probation, who's often also contracting for these services. Some drug courts contract for these services. So what's my template language that I can incorporate that ensures that I'm going to have um, excellent health care um, in my RFP? Data collection. What should I be collecting um, to demonstrate the outcomes? Um, I mean, we intuitively know some of this, but I think these sites are really challenging us about what's the first piece I should collect in the jail, what should I collect from probation, from the courts, from pretrial supervision. So this has really um, become our focus in the next two quarters. Um, I think AV and BJA and, and our partners in this project are really turning our attention to really hearing from the sites and turning around those products and, and um, getting those out into the field so that the sites that are just beyond them, um, the others that are ready and willing but just need resources um, can take advantage of this effort. So we're only halfway through this project, um, through the Bridges Project. We do have the Friends Institute as um, they're researching the um, project. So thank you to NIDA for their partnership in this effort. Um, we do anticipate offering funding um, at the end of the project through the COPE solicitation to those sites that want to pursue funding. Some of them have indicated it's not so much a funding thing. It is really the technical assistance that they needed. So we look forward to sharing more about outcomes um, next year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Tara, and thank you for pointing out the fact that sometimes the, the devil's really in the details, right? It's nice to have uh, the, having actual policy changes are the first step, but then really working out the detailed protocols that these very influential people like judges need to know. Uh, that's really key. And uh, next will be Jeff. Sorry for making fun of your title. No, no, <laughs> no long worries. Long title. <laughs> um, a big thank you to the O'Neill Institute and uh, Regina, Shelley, and, and your team. Uh, I think the report is fantastic. We'll certainly do our best to push that out uh, to states and governor's offices. Um, it's funny when you elect to be like the lone representative with a PowerPoint on a panel of really eloquent people. Um, <laughs> It's quite the, the challenge I have here, but I did want to acknowledge just a few people as well. Katie Green is my counterpart uh, from NGA. I'm with the National Governors Association. 
she is here today. I also want to acknowledge two other really magnificent state leaders who are here. Van Ingram from Kentucky. Kentucky's uh, overdose deaths, uh, the numbers you know, are encouraging. And Van, really, uh, I learn from him every time I talk to him. And Annie uh, from Vermont. Uh, is pushing the field on MAT and corrections, and I'm going to talk about uh, that in a moment, but I just want to acknowledge the great work that, that both of them are doing. So I've just been asked to talk a little bit about the national view from governor's offices uh, that we've heard on, on this issue, and I think some of this, you know, from the advocacy community, I know you want to push us to go further, and that's your role, and that's terrific. Um, some, of the, some of it, though, from the state perspective is to acknowledge where we've been, um, and I think, you know, five years ago when we started to get into this space, um, you know, when we gathered, our, our theory of the case is that states learn best from other states. So we, we brought eight states um, to Massachusetts in 2017, acknowledging at that point, early 2017, that there just wasn't a lot of kind of models to look at. Massachusetts was the longest running MAT state, albeit with one form uh, of medication. But really, at that juncture, the conversations were more around uh, why providing MAT was important uh, inside correctional settings and how you could help change cultures. And I really think the jump from five years ago has been a, a seismic sea change, both with correctional leaders and with governor's offices. So I, I think it's important that we at least acknowledge that. And I think there, you know, folks were hearing that Rhode Island had been the first to kind of jump in the water with all three forms. The data, I think, was more surprising to them. The JAMA article was coming out at that time. Additionally, they were providing, uh, you know, for the population that they were serving, 60% uh, of that population were, uh, were taking methadone, 39% uh, were taking buprenorphine, and 1% were taking naltrexone. So, some of this was flipping uh, their previous con you know, conceptions on this on its head, um, which I think was important. And I also want to say that Rhode Island, if you don't know Dr. Jo Josiah uh, Rich, uh, as well as Dr. Jen Clark, I mean, there are real profiles and courage in this country around this epidemic. And I do want to acknowledge that state leaders um, are part of that. Not, they're not the only ones. We have federal panels here, federal folks here stakeholders and, and sheriffs. These are all part of, I think, what will be an unwritten story of hopefully success down the line. Uh, but we weren't done. I think what we said to our partners at CDC, and I should thank them as they're our thought partners and they've supported us over the last eight years in this epidemic um, to engage with governor's offices, what we said to them is who can we kind of go deeper with uh, with state prisons? Because I think, you know, when you look at admits to the overall justice system, there's a lot, um, you know, coming into the jails, the most are coming into the jails. But where folks sit the most are within state prisons. And I think the numbers are really, the, the data is poor in terms of how many folks in those state prisons have substance use disorders. Uh, we, don't, we don't really have good data on that, frankly. So I think what we said to CDC is, what if we partnered with the American Correctional Association, who have a really terrific ne network of correctional health leaders inside state prisons? Dr. Kathleen Maurer from Connecticut is incredible. Um, so what we've thought to do is, is, again, bringing states to see other states. So we brought Annie from Vermont, uh, the folks from Rhode Island, uh, Delaware also now has all three forms of MAT. But I, again, still correctional leaders, leaders were saying to us, you know, those are unified systems. Is that, is that, you know, is that really kind of the same as my kind of system with 30,000 inmates um, and then we have separate jails? And Pennsylvania we brought along as well, which really I think has helped crack the case of why you can do this no matter if your state, if your state is unified or not. So um, with that, we are, have hosted two sets of workshops. We're going to host an, an additional two next year. Uh, so we'll have brought this at some point here, I think, to over 20 states is I think our goal over the coming year. Uh, but really what's most important, I think, is what we're seeing in terms of key short term strategies. Um, I usually just try to copy uh, Tara's talking points, and I think some of this uh, is representative on the slides here. Um, acknowledging Beth's point about the nationals. This town is taken over uh, by the Nats, and if you bear with me for one second, um, you know, the team of the Nats is kind of funny to watch. There's, you have the right mix of folks, and it's been exciting to see. Similarly, in public policy, and I don't think we spend a lot of time talking about this nationally, but getting the team right, I think, is super important. So I think what we've stressed to state leaders is you really need the following folks at the table to get this M18 correction question right inside state prisons. And those folks are the governor's office, uh, correctional directors, your, your correctional health executive, 
uh, the Medicaid uh, folks, and then you need your SSA, so the folks who are getting those SAMHSA dollars uh, at the table, and that is a nucleus that we're seeing as a winning combination. So I, I wanted to start there and mention that as a key, uh, key short-term strategy. The other thing is where the money's coming from. Tara obviously has done incredible work in BJA. Uh, SAMHSA, there's, they're using SOAR funding. Uh, some states are using uh, old tobacco dollars from 20, 30 years ago. Um, and we're also seeing kind of sizable state investments in this area, and we predict that going forward as well. Uh, a lot of the training questions are the same as you're seeing in jails. We need protocols. We need the same procedures that other states are using. We just want to replicate them. And I think that's where our value add is currently at the moment. Longer term, um, I, you know, I think I would echo Tara's point here around um, community supervision. I think there's been a big push around the correctional space. You're seeing investments in community supervision from foundations in terms of let's reform that side of the system. But the conversation I haven't seen yet is let's talk about MAT and community supervision in a very real candid way. Um, and I think that's what we're asking our governor's offices to do. So bringing those folks to the table early on so when you're setting up your induction programs to go to all three forms, community supervision is bought in from the beginning or at least they're at the table at the, uh, to start. A couple challenges as well. Um, I just want to flag in the last moment here. Um, you know, ultimately, the continuity of treatment is a real problem. So, you know, we're, we're asking questions of we have folks on buprenorphine, but their access in the community is non-existent. How do you kind of make sure that you can you can help with protocols with that piece? That's a big question. Uniform screening procedures. Uh, you know, frankly, what, if you've been to one correctional facility and asked what their screening pr procedure is, you've been to one correctional facility. So, uh, I think that's a real need in, in simplifying that in a way of have you used heroin, have you used prescription drugs or misused prescrip prescription drugs, something simple in that form. I'm not a clinician, uh, but that's what we're hearing what states are trying to do, uh, to, and, and hence noting, and I think Vermont's a great story, and hopefully Annie can talk a little bit about this in the Q&A, you know, you're seeing a mammoth uptick. You go from Vermont with just a handful of folks on uh, medication-assisted treatment to when they are screening folks with simple questions, you're getting nearly 1,000 folks uh, enrolled in MAT very shortly. So all to say, I think states are aware of the litigation, they're aware of the legislation, um, they know they need to engage community supervision, but ultimately they're trying to kind of ensure that they have buy-in both with the governor's office, but with their correctional uh, leaders as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. I was waiting to see who was going to make the first World Series reference, and it was you. So go Washington Nationals. Um, I, I'm a Canadian, so Washington Nationals used to be the Montreal Expos. So I guess I have to default cheer for cheer for them. Although I'm from Toronto. Um, <laughs> Blue Jays, Toronto Maple Leafs, woohoo. Um, last but most certainly not least, Mr. Michael White. Go ahead, Mike. So I also brought a PowerPoint. Uh, I still believe that science and data might be able to uh, guide us in policy. <laughs> so uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to share some of that with you all. Um, so we were lucky enough three years ago to get a MAPADOA grant out of uh, SAMHSA. And that grant was to provide MAT connections uh, connections to medication-assisted treatment from criminal justice touch points, and it also served uh, uninsured, and so non-Medicaid, non-private insurance, and so th that was the population we were really going after. So right now we're going to go through some of those referral sites that we were working with to get uh, attached to those folks. So right now we're looking at Maricopa County and Pima County Drug Court. We have staff that go into those staffings with the judge, with the clinician team, all those folks uh, as we're discussing to give real uh, time information to those folks and uh, referrals and such of that nature. Maricopa County Jail, this is the famous picture of Tent City. If you don't know about it, Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Uh, an arbitration happened in 2015, Graves versus Arpaio. Uh, the basic premise of it said that any health care you're allowed to have in the community, you should be able to have inside jail. Uh, a true champion named Dr. Alvarez took that opportunity to start uh, an opiate treatment program within that campus of facilities. There's five. To this day, all five are independently licensed as an opiate treatment program, so they are a wonderful partner uh, now under the guidance of Dr. Phillips. Um, we have staff that go in there daily. Uh, we definitely pay a lot of attention to pregnant women in that facility. Um, but we can provide inductions in that facility. Uh, they have a, several different substance abuse focused programs, so it's a, it's a really good model. 
This, I'm going a little offshoot just to promote naloxone. Uh, what we see in Maricopa County Corrections is about 900 people monthly come in with an opiate use history. About four to 500 of those could be diagnosed with opiate use disorder. If you don't think it's an issue for criminal justice, I would uh, encourage you that you're wrong. What this is demonstrating is uh, an initiative by that jail complex to put naloxone in the property bin of those folks that uh, reach a cow scale that they've predetermined that's um, adequate to not go bankrupt and provide the best service possible to those folks. And so you see about 338 uh, doses of naloxone put inside property bins. This is also combined with harm reduction strategies. Syringe access is illegal in Arizona, but that doesn't mean we don't have underground uh, resources to that. So we do provide that education around uh, naloxone and syringe access uh, to those individuals also. So Alhambra intake, anytime you go to prison, you gotta go through an intake center, they do a biopsychosocial, they do all those uh, health concerns for your folks. What we're able to do is when somebody going into prison, we do a 30 day taper. It's not the greatest thing, however, um, it is friendlier for corrections officers, it's friendlier for the patient, it's friendlier for everybody involved. We hope to expand that to a year or more of uh, maintenance, but uh, right now that's where it's at. Perryville Prison is the pregnant population. At any given time, inside Perryville Prison, we're supporting about eight to 10 pregnant women um, and just uh, trying to get as wrap around during that process as we can. So we have also uh, correctional health liaisons, we call them, go into that facility and talk to those ladies and then they also come into the clinic sometimes. So reentry centers. So this is a very cool project that Arizona uh, Department of Corrections has done. Uh, somebody who has gone to prison, been released, unfortunately is struggling again, is given a second opportunity to uh, by their probation officer, parole officer, to do a 30, 60, or 90 day program. Um, at that time, we'll look at this process. At that time, they're allowed to go to this facility to participate in basically eight to five, you know, eight in the morning to five at night, services around substance abuse and kind of learn some tools that uh, will help them be more productive. What we do for all these projects is provide them uh, medication assisted treatment. One of the major things we do for these projects, and I put this model up so we can have a guide, uh, is that a parole officer or a warden of this facility can call us up, say, hey, I got Jimmy Joe down here, he's withdrawing, we'd like to get him assessed for medication assisted treatment. We bring Jimmy Joe in because you have to do the induction face to face for methadone uh, right now, so they do an arm transport. They come over that day, we do the induction. After that, they go back to the facility. They never have to come out again. So what we do at that point is we get a, an exception, a federal exception for take home medication for that specific medication. And then we do any medication adjustments via telehealth. We then have a nurse go deliver that medication to that facility so that person can participate in their 90 day program without any uh, security threat to that facility, if that makes sense. Um, so we're gonna look at some data. We're gonna look at some outcomes from these, what, you, what most people would consider high risk uh, populations and then providing them medication assisted treatment. So I do wanna, I skipped it, but the sample size is 252. Um, and so the majority is utilizing methadone. There's another chunk utilizing buprenorphine, a very small population. It probably reflects closely to Rhode Island's, just a little more methadone. So uh, we're looking at um, demographics here. What's interesting is the 32% uh, post-education that always, uh, and the age group. And I'm gonna fly through these because I only have 10 minutes, so we're, we're doing a brain dump here. Um, <laughs> Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead, but race and ethnicity. So what we're seeing here is that we noticed a 33% reduction in arrest, and this is all third-party data, uh, the GIPRA. Has anybody done a GIPRA in here? They're fantastic, right? Uh, so then a third-party uh, data collection named Wellington helped us out with this data, so uh, it's pretty reliable. And then we saw a 38% reduction in drug arrests, we saw a 57% reduction in crimes committed, 57% reduction in nights spent in jail. What's interesting about this is drug court, the accountability measure for missing an IOP, intensive outpatient counseling group, or uh, a meeting with your probation officer is a night in jail. So there should be an asterisk there. If we could pull that information out of there, that number I believe would be much higher. 
We do have a Gipper follow-up rate of 75.25. That's the thing that I'm most proud of. Uh, my staff really uh, did some good work to get that rate. Uh, I don't recommend sharing this uh, slide with everybody because it can be misinterpreted. However, what it does is demonstrate active days of use. For, from a harm reduction model, this is phenomenal. From a criminal justice viewpoint that uh, has done a drug on war or war on drugs for the last uh, little while, um, this can be misinterpreted. So uh, hopefully you all have access to these slides and can utilize them if you need to. And then uh, I love the comment earlier about uh, social determinants of health. I'm right there. And so I, I always see it as you mean the things that we should have always done. And now we have this uh, fancy word for it. So everybody wants to say it. She said it much more eloquently than I ever could. But what we noticed was a 28% reduction in unemployment an 85% increase in employment. I just want that to settle in real quick. Um, and then a 43% increase in permanent housing. So with this model, we, we, um, we really did a lot of work in 2015. However, we've leveraged this model. I work in nine states, so I try to leverage this model everywhere I go. And so successfully, we've leveraged this model. North Dakota is phenomenal. There's a, uh, for the North Dakota Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, you have Dr. Hagen and Lisa Peterson. They are phenomenal. They're doing three years of maintenance for any three of the medications uh, because they know 90% of their population are going to serve 32 months or less. So they're basically understanding that they're going to get their entire opiate use disorder population. Uh, phenomenal group. I highly recommend anybody reach out to them. Alaska, um, Alaska brings up a point that a lot of these um, programs and projects exist because somebody passed away. Um, somebody got, uh, sorry, I, I can't help but to cuss, but uh, they got screwed over. Uh, somebody passed away, somebody's family member really got hurt, a baby died, these other things. And a lot of these correctional programs exist because of that. I don't think we need to wait for those things to happen to implement them. Um, but then uh, just moving on, sorry, I'm going to get emotional on everybody. Um, so yeah, Montana jails uh, and Montana DOC has a planning grant. They should be up and running in about three years. And then Wisconsin, we just got a BGA grant. And so we'll be implementing that in the next three to four months, I believe. And so that's just an honorable mention. But again, North Dakota. So uh, you think these small jails that may only serve 37 people annually, but you should still do it. A lot of people say, well, corrections needs to change the way they view it. Well, opiate treatment programs need to change the way they see it too. If you're prescribing a medication to somebody and the jail's gonna let you in, you need to figure out how to provide that service to someone, even if you get paid or not. It's your ethical obligation, in my viewpoint, um, to, to, to be able to do that. So I just wanna make that point that it, it's both sides that need to change the way they think, not just one. Alaska Department of Corrections, I mentioned, if you haven't heard the story of Kelsey Green, I'd highly encourage you to, to look it up, just Kelsey Green Anchorage. Uh, to me, it is, the, it is the story of the opiate epidemic, uh, by all means. And then Milwaukee, just that uh, we got the BJA grant, so that'll be up and running in the next three to four months, we believe, and so we thank BJA for that, and the people of Wisconsin and Milwaukee do too. And then I just wanted to provide these links. If you haven't seen them, they're very helpful. Uh, it's been mentioned several times, the NCCHC and ACA. We definitely see this encouragement from those agencies uh, to be pushing forward on this. Um, and it's been a great help from my viewpoint where I have to kind of be this corrections whisperer around diversion and these other things that get uh, worrious, worrisome for, uh, for that group. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, that was wonderful. Um, you know you have a great panel when they all are, follow the time limit and then get key points across in, in good time, so I really appreciate that. Um, you know, there's a, in listening to all the speakers talk about their uh, areas of expertise, there's certain recurring themes that come up. And one of them that I heard certainly was this idea of, um, you know, I, I didn't know before, but I know it now, this idea of stigma, um, uh, lack of education, awareness uh, amongst all of us and amongst our constituents, our communities. And there was something that you mentioned, Sheriff, uh, talking about the, the incredible results in Albany County and uh, with the help of uh, OASA 
DHS and, and the local government and state government. But you had mentioned that when it came to, you were using naltrexone, uh, injectable version, uh, commercially known as Vivitrol at first, there was some results, but not really. Uh, and then you really incorporated all three of the FDA approved medications, it sounds like. Um, and this is, by the way, everything that I talk about in these talks, I make very clear in, in all my talks that I give nationwide, everything that I'm talking about has been from on-the-job training. So that's why I made a specific point to the medical students from Georgetown that were speaking. I wish I had that level of training and understanding of addiction as a chronic health issue um, when I was early on. But you know, you, you learn, and I, I feel a responsibility to share what I learned with everyone, and I'm grateful to all of you. But Sheriff, you said that you were against it at first, um, and you cited the example of, well, you know, Suboxone was, was small smuggled in, and I gotta tell you, when I was working at Rikers Island, one of the trainings I gave to the wardens and all of the officers and leadership down from there was that uh, the, the buprenorphine actually works and saves lives, and the warden right away, one, one of the wardens in one of the jail said, whoa, 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 wait, I, it's contraband. I've been telling my officers it's contraband, and I'm like, I, I, I know, but uh, the way that, at least at Rikers, the, the, our solution to it was, to, the diversion problem was to prescribe it more widely. So I'm just curious, what helped you with that shift in per perspective? Um, mainly the 20,000 emails I got from <laughs> Keith Brown in Albany. <laughs> um, I'd wake up, I'd have Keith Brown emails. I'd go to sleep, I'd have Keith Brown emails. Can he, I just interrupt? Uh, so uh, Twitter, hashtag Jew policy, <laughs> Jew addiction policy. And uh, yeah, Keith Brown, uh, tweet quick, Keith. So. Um, Again, listen, to, to just digress real quick, we, we did back in the 80s and 90s through crack cocaine and everything else, we tried to arrest our way out of it. And that was the methodology here too. People were like, you know what, just throw them in jail, throw them in jail, throw them in jail. That's how Albany County is a thousand person jail in a 325,000 populous uh, county. So, you know, I thought the Vivitrol would be the, the next thing. I'm like, this is great, it's a non-narcotic, it's awesome, the first shot was free by the pharmaceutical company, obviously self-serving, but still, they're gonna get out and, and be clean and hopefully they stay on it. And then um, started to look at a lot of the, the evidence-based data and I'm like, geez, I, I think I'm doing this wrong here, I really need to open this up more. And you're right, I mean, by prescribing it, you're serving and saving you know, dozens and dozens and that's what we switched to. And um, we started with a three phase, um, phase one took off. Um, we were like, wow, we're burning up funding. And, and that's something that kind of irritates me as well, is, and you can hear it in almost everybody that speaks is, well, we gotta look at funding, 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 and the data and everything else. And I look at it in a different format of, you know what, these are human freaking lives, and we need to do everything we can as government officials to save them and um, we'll figure it out. But if you look at keeping people from coming back to jail and, and your recidivism uh, rate is going down, you can then start to reappropriate some of the funds you have. You know, you're serving less meals, you're serving, you're serving less pharmaceuticals out of your medical, and you know, you, you, your tiers are closing down. So you can save a lot of those monies. And that's how we've done it with the assistance of Oasis. We don't have any grants or anything like that. Um, we just figured, you know what, let's save the lives and sort it out later. And that's, um, that's the format that we took. Yeah. It by the way, um, hope Michael and folks know that our panel is also being very is swear friendly. So, like the, like the fireside chat, uh, <laughs> no swear, no, no, no. I, hey, man, say whatever you want. I don't care at all. Um, but uh, but to cite the 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 ex of the poignant conversation at the fireside chat with Michael, Tracy, and the mayor, um, y you know, it's about priorities. This idea of oh, we don't have funding, and this idea of you know, you're going to get pushbacks. I'm sure all of you have faced pushbacks in your jobs, saying, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that, we don't have the resources. Operationally, it's, it's just not gonna be possible. It's about priorities, and it's taxpayers' dollars, right? It's uh, Oasis as, as a state agency, it's, 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 it's funneling taxpayers' dollars and understanding what's important. It's, it's lives, it's livelihood. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that. You know, Beth, you were also talking about um, when you were at, through Pew, doing the trainings and something that you discovered was really this, this pervasive stigma among staff. Uh, I, I, I will say what I noticed, um, what I experienced working at New York City jails is that the when I approached the chief of, uh, of, of corrections, who at the time, Chief Murphy, 
big guy, very intimidating looking guy. So when I approached him in his office, you know, he was sitting behind his desk and I said, um, Chief Murphy, I'm, I'm uh, in my new role as the addiction medicine director. Um, what I, I'd like to provide training, like addiction 101, uh, which I'm providing to the medical staff because huge gaps in knowledge uh, amongst the doctors and the nurses, but also to our IT and HR. But I'd also like to offer it to your corrections officers who are really first line. And the first thing he said to me, very humbly, almost hunched over, said, whatever you have to offer, we'd love to learn. So you really need, you know, I think back to, to M Mayor Williams, Steve Williams, and uh, what Ms. Gardner, Tracy, was saying to him is that, you know, he was humbly saying, no, it was the community, but you got to have leadership uh, acknowledging their gaps in knowledge and what needs to be done. So I'm curious, um, Beth, uh, you know, you said you start with education of staff. What are some of the th things that you heard from the staff in terms of maybe some stigmatizing attitudes and how did you actually address those? So um, the program uh, really was uh, cultivated uh, through the New Jersey Department of Corrections. So the leadership there, the Commissioner of Corrections, really acknowledged that the state prison staff needed to be educated. Um, I think what was surprising to them was that the clinical staff needed the education as much as the correctional staff. Um, uh, they took it as a surprise, but you know, in our conversations, uh, they they thought that perhaps the the clinical staff would recognize and understand the disease of addiction, uh, but it didn't seem to be true. Um, we also heard, you know, about pushback uh, from the correctional health staff uh, about their own um, biases uh, around medications for addiction treatment. So this was is something that surprised. So in their head, it was the idea is like we should to work with all the correction staff, um, but then also realizing now that they had to then develop a curriculum to work with the clinical staff. Uh, it's been very fruitful for them. Uh, the attitudes have changed across the system. One thing they do point out, it was important for them to use um, peer corrections folks, not to have some outsider come in, but to actually have someone within the system or someone who understood the system, knows the system, uh, to come in and provide the training to them. It was much better received. Um, and then um, they've seen some success moving forward. So this is something we will em uh, emulate with the counties. That's great. Um, and, and by the way, I encourage all of the, the, the panelists to jump in whenever uh, there's something you want to talk about. Uh, we also want to make sure we leave time for, for questions and comments. Um, I often find that the most engaging part of at least the talks that I give is really the comments from, th from the audience. Whether you agree or disagree, I, we want to hear from you. Um, it, it, Tara, I really, uh, uh, I think the Bridges Project uh, has been really remarkable, uh, providing technical assistance, and I assume it, part of that is really education and implementation of, of programs. You also mentioned the work, and you recognize the work of the National Sheriff's Association and their uh, adoption and impl imp implementation of MAT uh, medications. Can you just clarify, uh, do, do they um, uh, utilize uh, and implement all three forms, including methadone, buprenorphine, or is it still mostly naltrexone? Um, so the, the, I want to acknowledge the National Sheriff's Association as well as the ACA that Jeff mentioned earlier and the, the major sheriffs, uh, major county sheriffs. Um, I really have found all of the associations to be talking fairly openly about all three forms um, and the data surrounding all three forms. Um, so I think they've done a remarkable job of, of presenting the options and the benefits. Um, so may I um, take your invitation to chime in on one, one thing? I, um, the, the, this, when you don't use PowerPoint, you forget one of your points um, of what we're learning out of our sites that I want to um, piggyback off of the question around stigma. Um, much to my surprise, one of the things that we're learning from our sites is the stigma among peer recovery uh, coaches. Um, and um, a lot of jails are introducing peer recovery coaching into jails. It's also being introduced in, in probation and other criminal justice-based programs, drug courts. Um, but one of the things we're hearing from the sites is that there's some stigma against MAT in that community. Um, so that it's interesting what you learn when you have a cohort of sites teaching you things. Um, so I think there's um, space to really do outreach to that group as well. Yeah, thanks for adding that. I I am still, you know, I, I work in the addiction space and have been for several years now, and 
I, I still do most of my education amongst my colleagues um, in the addiction space. And again, I, I try not to do so in a very, in a hierarchical kind of way. I just say, hey, I never learned this in my training, but now that I know it, in fact, I want to quote something that one of my colleagues in the space, Dr. Mishka Turplin, uh, I've heard him say in his talks, and you'll hear from him this afternoon, you know, you can't unlearn, sometimes it's harder to unlearn what you've already learned. And now that I know that these medications are life-saving, methadone, buprenorphine, as well as naltrexone, they're life-saving. I also uh, learned that some of the words and phrases that I used to use uh, were really harmful. Um, and folks like Mr. Michael Botticelli and other folks like Sarah Wakeman and, and uh, Rich Sates and John Kelly, they've really published uh, the, the, the studies showing that words matter. I, I know I don't have to tell this audience this, but especially in the addiction field, words matter. And so when we use phrases like substance abuser, drug abuse, your urine is dirty, um, it, it actually has harm to patients. Uh, they are less likely to seek care, more likely to perceive discrimination, and healthcare professionals spend less time in clinic and label people with addiction as mo unmotivated, manipulative, angry, all of that adds up to suboptimal care. So um, to both of your points, uh, really, the healthcare profession, we're, we're, we have uh, ways to go, but we're, we're working. I, I believe I'm somebody that's optimistic because I'm already seeing some changes, but I'm also a type A physician. Nothing happens fast enough. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I, you know, I, Jeff, I, I, again, I want everyone to chime in here, but uh, you know, you talked about, um, first of all, I thank you so much for talking about the different states, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. I gotta tell you, People like Dr. Jody Rich, Jennifer Clark, and Kate Maurer are really heroes of mine, and they're mentors and colleagues in this space, really come integrating medicine, evidence-based medicine, in the correctional space, uh, which is, is is challenging, but they, they're really doing it. But they're uh, creating a model of what can happen. Um, and three different states with three different kind of models. So, you know, you talked a little bit about um, uh, the ACA uh, and um, sometimes um, uh, this pushback of, oh, well, those are a unified correctional settings, you know. Um, I'm curious how how you've been addressing that, that kind of pushback and resistance in terms of like really charging forward. Yeah, and, and again, I would encourage, you know, others in the room who are state leaders to chime in on that conversation as well. But I think what we've seen is that the seeing is believing. So if, if they're able to see the systems, what they're doing, that's, I think, pushing the conversation forward. So seeing what Pennsylvania and Stephen Sidecheck there, uh, the Secretary Wetzel of Corrections, the Governor's Office, uh, their ability to push through a system that I think has over 40,000 folks with different pilots with all three forms of MAT, I think that's a really good, you know, that answers that question, can this be done outside of uniform systems um, itself? Just uh, one other piece as well that we, I think we've heard that, you know, as we move forward here, I, I think something for both kind of jails and prisons to be thinking about, I know, you know, Tara thinks about this, I'm sure the sheriff does, a well, does as well in, in Pew, uh, but you know, what, what's the kind of evaluation that we're looking for in this space? And what are the partnerships that we wanna kind of be pushing I think we're seeing state systems uh, look to state university systems. So, you know, who can kind of be partnering with them to kind of track this over time so we don't have to be keep, keep making the ROI discussion five years from now and really we can be actually pushing forward. And I know JCoin is, is, is encouraging and what NIDA is doing there, but um, I think states have a role to play in that discussion as well. So I just want to kind of put out this idea of evaluation. It's not just recidivism. What are the other things that we want to be kind of evaluating as well? Um, so I just wanted to kind of add that as well. Yeah, um, so Jeff, Jeff makes a really great point. One thing that we hear from other states is that, you know, what are other states doing and what is their data, what are their outcomes? And so really getting states to um, gather this data, we know it's hard because it takes, uh, sometimes it takes money, um, but there also has to be an emphasis and understanding that the data that you collect and the evaluations that you can put forward will really drive this home, especially in converting other states um, and you know, showing them that there actually is an opportunity um, for them to to do something um, in a good space. So really getting states to share their data with everybody else is so important. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, who was it? It was Jeff who said, states learn best from other states. I think that was a, a, a great line. Um, and uh, before we move on to Michael, I, I encourage all of you to formulate any kind of questions or comments that you have and uh, use the microphones. Uh, I want to say, you know, there's a very common saying in the addiction space, I think many of you have already heard it, uh, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. And I think a lot of the work that, Michael, you're doing with community medical services uh, really highlights uh, the importance of that connection. It's not only between the, the patient or the individual experiencing addiction to connecting him or her to their families, to healthcare system, to support services, but it's also connecting one another to, uh, to the different conversations so we're not, as Michael said earlier, not just practicing in silos, um, but we're talking to one another and learning and filling each other's gaps in knowledge. Um, I'm so glad that you talked about um, the access for uh, the pregnant women who are behind bars and getting them uh, uh, these women access. Can you clarify uh, what medications they're receiving and are they receiving the medications and access to services after delivery? Yeah, the majority of the time they're receiving methadone, sometimes uh, sublocate or, or uh, subutex, which is a buprenorphine product. Um, and so it, it depends on the state or the institution or the facility, but uh, most of the time it is methadone. Um, I'd like to share a story with you just to highlight that um, point. And so um, back in the early days, 2015, I was in drug court and a young lady gets A-listed, which means she um, did everything she was supposed to and uh, compliant urine analysis and all these other things. And so Commissioner White at the time, uh, you know, standing applause, she gets to get out of court early, which is the best gift. Uh, you don't have to sit there for three hours. And so on her way out, um, she said, hey, I have a dependency court case uh, w this afternoon. Would you go with me? And so an hour later, we're eight miles away in a different courthouse for a dependency court. And if you don't know that, her, her child uh, is She's being judged whether she can be a parent for her child. So uh, the court doesn't even necessarily start, and a judge says, I am moving to sever the rights of your child today because you continue to be on methadone, and it was over. She still does not have her child. So what was interesting that July of 2015 is I, I kind of went back and I was thoroughly upset. Um, I'm very calm right now, but I was upset. Um, and so did some just back research and come to find out this young lady, uh, you know, she's in a residential. They would have supported her and her child. Um, she was a combat vet. She was tied in with the VA. Um, she had a, a drug court team, so PO, judge, all the things that come along with that. She had a Department of Child Safety or a CPS team, so all the things that are associated with that. None of our systems were talking together. We were all probably just um, traumatizing her day and day again by bringing up the same questions and having her do the same thing. She's with two urine analysis providers. I mean, the, the difficulty that we've made this young lady's life, and she never really complained about it. She just did what she was supposed to do. Uh, to this day, she still does not have her child. But what, and you know, I mentioned all these programs and it kind of goes back to that point that all, uh, most of the projects I have exist because of some sacrificial lamb. Like just somebody lost something big to, to have them up and running. So, um, sorry. So what's interesting about that is um, it, it caused this uh, step to action, right? This call to action. And so we, we got with the director of DCS, we've done hundreds upon hundreds of trainings to that system. Um, and we've put a big focus on the, the attachment of that. And so the, the pregnant ladies, we have a definite focus on when they're coming out of corrections. Um, you know, we're even looking at um, infant care plans for pre-dependency court hearings. So actually getting them in the court process and beating the DCS investigators to it before the hospital. So our ladies show up to the hospital with a booklet in their hand. It has their urine analysis. It has their participation in groups. We do parenting classes before the baby comes because that makes sense <laughs> instead of after the baby comes. Um, and so all these preemptive things. And so then when that DCS or the Department of Child Safety worker comes into that hospital, they say, let me enjoy the birth of my child. Take this book. It has all the information. If you have follow-up questions, come talk to me in two days, you know. But let me enjoy my time right now. So that's what we're doing. 
Uh, thanks, Michael. You know, uh, thank you for sharing that story. There's a common, another common saying that, I, and I firmly believe in this: the only way to move the needle forward when it comes to not just the opioid crisis, but just addiction in general, it's through science and storytelling. Um, you've already heard several people this, just this morning alone that are excellent storytellers and they know their data. Michael Tracy, Mayor Steve, they all, they know the science, but they have so many personal stories. Um, but sharing stories like that is a reminder that it's not just about data, even though we're really pro data, but uh, I, I, Beth, you gave this great image about the 47,000, but sometimes numbers we just, are just overwhelming. What's what's 5,000, 5 million? But when you, but I can picture the stadium, and how every single one of them are, are dead. You know, so so it's stories when you bring it down to the individual and the fact that addiction really it's it's such a it's a medical, psychological, social a problem that just it, it impacts adversely impacts every aspect of society. Um, if, are there any questions, comments right now? Uh, please, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Jeremiah Golka. I'm with uh, the Health and Justice Action Lab at Northeastern University. I work with Leo Beletsky. And I just wanted um, to thank everybody for this uh, great panel, and this, this whole event is great. I want to just... Um, a quick comment to support uh, what you're saying about um, language and narrative uh, as a resource for people to use if you want, because there's often the concern about what's language not to use, but then you're left wondering what is good language to use. And yes, you know, we should do person first language, but what's good language? Well, we're leading initiative an initiative to provide some of that language that we might need. So the website to check out is called changingthenarrative.news, as so we're trying to help change this narrative for a better narrative. So check it out, changingthenarrative.news, and you can find plenty of language to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for citing Leo Boletsky, yet another uh, impactful person in this space from a, a legal and policy perspective. Um, it, it, oh, go ahead, yes sir. Hi, Van Ingram, uh, Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy. I think this question is probably for Michael. Um, we've had a naltrexone program within our, our prison for a number of years. We're in the implementation phase of adding buprenorphine. The one we're struggling with is methadone. Um, we have about 26 locations that are either medication stations or, or full-blown methadone clinics. When you put those and overlay them on a map, we have great desert areas where people would need to drive an hour, hour and a half every day to dose. So we're struggling with, is that unethical to put someone on methadone when you know they go home, they're not gonna easily have that available to them. You, you work in rural states, is that, is that an issue uh, where you come from? I have that same uh, ethical debate with myself. Uh, sometimes it can be accomplished, and you said Kentucky, I apologize. Yes. And so we stole an idea from y'all, I think, in med units. And so being able to establish med units closer to corrections and um, be able to serve more rural communities. So we've done some of that in Arizona and looking at North Dakota and Montana um, and some of those things. But yeah, you're absolutely right. When you're, um, we've had people move to a city so they could, you know, because the other medications they've tried and didn't work. And so sometimes it's relocation, unfortunately, but you know, I constantly have this discussion in particular with uh, Montana just because it's so spatial. And so, you know, um, in my view, buprenorphine is probably the more ethical choice, but that's just personal opinion. But um, there's a lot of, I always want to say there's a hundred different solutions to a problem. And so, um, Michael, is that your choice? You, when you say ethical choice, is that because of logistically, it's just more challenging? with a methadone and I mean in every state I, I work we have people driving two three hours we sometimes have people driving from South Dakota to North Dakota um, and so transportation is a huge barrier for our folks I'm gonna I'm just looking at Michael here I mean so Massachusetts is one of the states I used I, I lived there for several years um, the very very pro with evidence and science but uh, Michael wouldn't you also say that access to methadone is not widely accessible in the entire state it's, it's difficult yeah. So, uh, so uh, 100%. So, 
you know, I, it's moments like this when I really, really miss Dr. Robert Newman. Bob Newman was just a, so such an advocate for this medication, which is really life-saving. The reason why most people in this country don't have access to it, it's, 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 it's a regulatory issue. It really is. This is a medication that works. If you look at countries like Canada, uh, Portugal, any doctor can prescribe it. Uh, it's, every pharmacy dispenses it. In Portugal, widely accessible. They have vans distributing uh, this medication. So, and again, I think you were all talking about like the pushback and the logistical challenges uh, that I know you're going to hear from from sheriffs and uh, other leadership. But I, I also don't blame them because when you discharge patients, where are you going to send them to? Telemedicine is maybe one possible solution. But, um, uh, je sir, go ahead. Lubrin, National Alliance for Medication Assisted Recovery. I wanted to follow up with uh, Van's comment and Michael's comment. Uh, last month, uh, some Yale researchers published a letter in JAMA where they had a study of five uh, Appalachian states, including Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, Virginia, and they looked at access to um, dialysis, federally qualified health centers, and opioid treatment. And of course, they found that the amount of time it takes for an individual to go to dialysis or a primary care center was considerably less than it was for addiction treatment. Their proposal was to expand access through primary care, federally qualified health centers, et cetera. And I just wondered what your reaction might be to that. <clears throat> I've helped several agencies walk down the road of uh, implementing medication-assisted treatment into their um, agencies. And so, again, the regulations in place and just the amount of work it takes to right now get something up and running is very difficult. I think everybody has the idea of doing it, but um, once they start walking down that path, it becomes very difficult with all the um, licensure regulations. And so I absolutely agree that things need to change and make it more available. Um, I think med units and some of these other things are possibilities within the restrictions and guidelines that currently exist to, to expand. Um, but yeah, I would love to see what we discussed earlier. I mean, if this was a leukemia epidemic, would we make patients drive three hours to get chemo? I mean, I, I, I know there are some patients that do that, but it's it's not really the norm. We we uh, we uh, have a system that's uh, we're setting people up to fail, um, ma'am. Hi, Anna Black from Maine Department of Corrections. So we were late to the game, um, but we're now implementing MAT in three of our facilities, four of our facilities, and one coming up next month. But I wonder, as we've done done a lot of work on the opioid use disorder issue inside with MAT, with staff training, with the language, what lessons you all have learned that we can use to ready for the next wave of, of public health issues that are going to be seen inside of our criminal justice systems, particularly Hep C, for example, which in Maine we are facing, um, maybe with the stimulants that are coming next and other public health issues. How can we use what we're learning with the implementation of MAT to ready ourselves for what's next. I think you um, hit the, uh, the nail on the head when you talk about education, um, because we know that uh, psychostimulants are um, making a resurgence. Um, they're also being coupled with opioids. Um, so this um, really is something that we're seeing now. We hear it from a lot of states. So really getting out and educating and making education part of something that's part and parcel of the workflow within any type of agency, including a correctional system, so it doesn't become this like one-off thing I have to learn that I'm constantly being educated on um, HIV, on hep C, on psychostimulants, um, opioid use disorder, and substance use disorder in general. So I'd love to follow up on that. My name is Caleb Van de Green. I'm from the University of Washington in Seattle. We just um, hosted a, a math policy symposium in June. We've had math for decades. Um, and then also just gave a talk a couple weeks ago, actually, about how can we expand low barrier access to medications for opioid use disorder, how do we use those models for other substances and behavioral health issues. And so I just want to share with you our brief model and hear what you all are seeing that might be similar because I think the basic problem with reentry is that it's way easier to get heroin and fentanyl than it is to get these medications, which is economic decisions that we're making as a society. So what we've started doing is providing same-day access to medications at, you know, syringe exchanges, homeless shelters, um, and no appointment, drop-in, 
Uh, polysubstance use is fine initially and ongoing because most people use multiple substances, and they will also stay on their Suboxone and other medications even as they use other substances, and their illicit opioid use will go down, and their mortality will go down. So part of that is also staffing that with nurse care managers and care navigators or whatever you want to call them today. <laughs> but I think that type of care team, that staffing model, and that general approach, which just expands from, you know, whether you want to call it harm reduction or person-centered public health care, I don't care. <laughs> it's all the same stuff. And it really is actually giving, you know, we want customers, right? We need to build systems that want customers. Right now, you think we would not want customers coming in and getting our services. So I think it's just trying to flip that around, flip that narrative. And then if you're doing that, if you're giving people added value, they're going to come. When we first built a low-barrier buprenorphine program, we have a paper in substance abuse this summer. Within a couple weeks, we had people lining up two hours early to get treatment medications. That's a, that's a, I mean, it's a problem, but it's a great problem to have. And I think it really is important for enabling enabling um, our correction systems to actually get people started on medications. It also enables primary care providers to stop complaining about how hard it is to induce patients because it's not. But if they need somebody else to do it for them, we'll do it for them. But we need to build in these systems of care, create a real continuum for everyone. Thank you, Caleb. Any comments uh, from the panel? Thank you. Jeff, go ahead. No, I mean, I think you would have seen a lot of heads nodding back at you, Caleb, on that. I mean, I think there's a recognition that in, you know, reentry systems look very different across the United States. I mean, I think to Van's point, Kentucky looks different than parts of Washington, but other parts of Washington do look like Kentucky. So I, I think the other question really that I think we grapple with from the Governor's Association when we're thinking about our corrections agencies is, is where the where budgeting is going with respect to reentry. When you're going to prioritize reentry, I, I, you know, I think you've seen states elevate uh, the budgets for reentry offices to be really trying to map and think strategically about reentry to solve some of the problems that Van is raising that, and that you're articulating with a model. And I think after that, then it's really elevating those models and trying to get them replicated to the extent they can. Yeah, and I just want to follow up on something Beth said, and uh, which I think was also a follow up from the earlier fireside chat about, you know, yeah, right now the the, the drug that we're talking about is uh, the class is opioids, but there's always going to be something, right? There always was. Uh, it was cocaine in the 80s. It was heroin years ago, centuries ago, and morphine. And there's always going to be something. And it's and it's not just that psychostimulants are increasing. There are some states where that's the leading drug, actually. Um, so you know, and 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 just addressing these uh, some of these racially driven policies we just need to address this as a it's a health concern that that impacts every aspect of society let's get people the care that they need and deserve and create systems so that it's just chronically accessible um, so that we don't have to readjust every time for every single drug and substance um, ma'am Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. I am the Annie from Vermont. Um, so thank you, Jeff, and thank you, panel. I am in the house. I'm also available all day um, for anybody to come and pick my brain and to add to the discussion. I've been at this for a long time. The department has been engaged in providing MAT in the correctional system for since 2013, and I've been on that ride. Um, it's been an exciting journey. Um, secondly, I'd like to make a plug for internal partnerships, internal state partnerships. We have a strong collaboration with our Medicaid agency, which is called the Department of Vermont Health Access. They are in our, our payer, essentially. So they are helping to provide added evaluation and care coordination and really a longitudinal survivor study in the state of Vermont ongoing. This is providing a new exciting template for all chronic illness care management. Um, not only is the data collection going to be incredibly p uh, powerful and helpful in helping us sustain this effort and prove that this investment is worth more than worthwhile, but we're also going to be adding a fourth layer to that effort um, in that we will be hopefully very soon having inmates sign additional waivers so that upon release and even pre-release, we're going to have chronic care initiative care managers 
who are part of the Medicaid system reaching out to them in addition to the supervision they'll be getting from the community, from probation officers, from everybody else who cares. We have an extensive peer support system as well, really an, a recovery-oriented system of care throughout the, the facility and into release. But these chronic care initiative uh, care, care, care coordinators will also be providing them constant care and we're gonna be really mining the gaps in treatment when they fall off. Lastly, Van, hi. Nice to see you. Um, for those of you who are Medicaid expansion states, um, uh, there are a lot of hidden costs. Um, the hidden cost of transportation is obviously critical. Um, the state of Vermont for non-emergency medical transports spends 16 to 18 million dollars a year simply getting people to treatment. So I am definitely gonna be beating that drum because that's an added cost. Thank God it doesn't come out of my budget, but it needs to come out of somebody's budget because it cannot be borne on the backs of our citizens who are simply trying to access their human right to health care. Uh, thank you, Annie from Vermont. Yet another state. Um, the Vermont hub and spoke model, Dr. John Brooklyn, yet another individual who I contact all the time, just like I contact my former colleagues in Boston. I just emailed Rich and Alex Wally yesterday. I mean, these are people, I encourage all of you to really get to know the, your fellow attendees, uh, not just the people on the stage, because there's so many of you that are doing great, great work. So please talk to one another. Um, any other comments from the panel? Uh, uh, go ahead, sir. Good morning, my name is Jeff Laredo. Um, for my sins, I recently retired after 30 years as a federal drug policy person, the last 15 of which were at NIDA. Good to see you, Dr. Roy. Uh, two quick things. One, I wanted to um, double or triple down on the, it, today it's opioids. It's not, and it's not just opioids today. CDC just released its data, 19 states west of the Mississippi, Yes, they have opioid problems. The number one drug associated with, with overdose deaths is meth today. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, not, not tomorrow, but right now. So we, we all owe it to ourselves and to um, the country to be beating that drum every day. Not because we shouldn't perhaps be using the rhetoric around the opioids crisis and the overdose crisis as a tip of the spear. That's what get, perhaps gets us in the room or gets us in the discussion, but we're doing a disservice to the country, to our patients, to families all across the country by, by not saying that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, the criminalization of addiction for the last, pick a number, any number of, of years, I'll say 50 because why not, um, means that some of you are at the table. This is a really important panel. You're doing God's work. People like me who spent most of our, I actually started my federal career at OJP, at the National Institute of Justice. I don't have anything personal against the justice and the correction system, quite the contrary. I don't think you should be the ones at the table, in theory. Today, you should be because that's our system and you have to deal with what you have and, and lessen until you change it. But um, for, for many policy folks, for many folks who've worked not just in the health system, but especially in the health system, we don't, for the most part, we don't want to have to talk with you. We don't think that you should, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, have to be dealing with this. It's unrealistic to suggest that you shouldn't because addiction is everywhere, has been, will be. But for the enforcement community, generally, to have to, 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 have, to have a leading role here, for many of us, is, um, I'll, I also won't be profane, is, is backwards. Even the, uh, Michael, for years I tortured you by saying, by uh, you and others, for, for all of us who said or used to say we can't arrest our way out of the problem, for speaking personally, that's part of the problem. That's part of the societal stigmatization of addiction and of people who use drugs, frankly, whether they are addicted or not, that we have all, thought about this health issue, not somehow rhetorically as a health issue. So that's not really a question, it's more of uh, my opinion. And thank you for letting me say that.
<laughs> Thank you, Van. <laughs> you know, I, uh, was it, uh, it was Jeff who said, you know, states learn best from other states. Well, I think countries also really should learn best from other countries. And um, there's so much that this country has to offer uh, the world, but there are things that we can also learn from other other um, nation states. And uh, I think of I think of my own home country, Canada, but I also think of Portugal, which decriminalized all drugs in 2001. But when I met with their national drug policy leader, Dr. Shua Gulao, last summer, and uh, as well as their other uh, 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 policymakers, they'll tell you, yeah, decriminalization was a part of it, but really what they did was they took a public health approach from every minister, from the Ministry of Justice and Health and Social Services. Uh, they all came together and decided we need to work on this. And was it you, Jeff or Michael, one of you said, or was it, uh, sorry, I'm, I may not be giving proper credit, but somebody said that, the, uh, I hate to say it, but the right person kind of has to die, right? The right people have to die. And um, in Portugal, the, the daughter of the Minister of Justice died from a heroin overdose. And when that happened, he made sure every jail and prison in Portugal uh, pr provided every medication, certainly methadone, buprenorphine, but so, you know, I, I, I hate to say that's a morbid kind of take, but it's kind of reality uh, too, but let's hope that, that we don't get there. Um, I think for time purposes, we'll have you as a, a last question. Jeff, yeah, go, go ahead, Jeff. Before that, I just wanted to j not push back. Is it, was it Jeff from, yeah. I, I mean, I take your point from the justice field that, you know, public health didn't want to kind of see this over in, in quite rightly, but I'm just wondering, like, if, is it productive at this stage to be, you know, thinking about that? I mean, I, I think where where we're at now is perhaps there was too many years of not talking to each other and being really good at siloing within our respective fields, within uh, levels of government, that I think, frankly, at this point, we've exacerbated and now have to overcorrect and go back and create those partnerships. So, I mean, I take your point about, you know, this is, this is a public health approach, it should be public health leading, but I think we got really, really good at not talking to each other for frankly, a long time before my career started. So, I mean, I, I just, that's also important to think about as well. I agree, I agree, I agree. Uh, let's have a last question and then we'll have conversations after. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, Joey Nichols, um, family physician, consultant for the Baltimore County Health Department where we're putting um, medication assisted therapy in the Baltimore County Jail for the first time. There's other jurisdictions in Maryland that are following our uh, not the lead, we were just kind of reluctantly, we got the grant basically. And then all these public health people <laughs> get invited to the party and we'll show up to any party that you're invited to if you've got money, you wanna work on the thing that saves lives, cool, we're totally there. Which is how I think about the, 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 the corrections public health dynamic. But um, what I get a little interested in, I mean, I get invited to lots of meetings and we have all these great conversations about opioids and um, I don't always know what question we're answering, but the answer always is like money is kind of what it boils down to, right? And I think we can all agree, you know, based on the conversations earlier today, there's plenty of money to go around, lots of resources, it's in the wrong places. So what I'm wondering is if in all of your various travels, if any of you have seen people directing, directly addressing this problem head on, every balance sheet's got two sides. And in public health, we care about the money coming in because we're gonna spend that and do good with it, right? But I think if I was at a hospital, hospital executive or if I was in a different agency of government, if I'm, the, if I'm responsible for Medicaid spending, uh, if I'm in the transportation side, you know, if I'm in the housing authority, probably the problem of drug addiction in my community is incredibly expensive to me on that expense side. And if we're doing all this really hard work in the jails and all these people are living and thriving, putting their lives together, how do we get some of that savings back, right? That wrong pocket problem is really pervasive. And, 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 and to, you know, we're all waiting for the day where all the state legislatures say, here's all the money you need. This is just medical treatment. Prisoners are the only people in the United States with constitutionally protected right to medical treatment. So, you know, we can work with that, but in the very, very long period of time before that actually becomes a reality, you know, I'm worried about this, like the wrong pocket kind of a problem. And to get who is getting the money that's being saved by all of our hard work and using that to build sustainable funding sources moving forward until that day comes. Over. Who wants to address that? <laughs> Look at almost any savings in government always goes to a sexy project. <laughs> Addiction's not a sexy project, right? I mean, we try project after project, innovative ideas. Um, you know, as I talked about early on about our re-entry program, if, they're, if they don't have a place to stay, we turned a wing in our jail into um, basically like tiny rooms. Got rid of the bars, everything. Um, got them all set up so we can start to work on them getting back into society. 
go out, get a job, come back in, we'll show you how to set up a bank account, everything else. We're working with local hospitals to take some of the homeless that are going into the hospitals, tying up beds, nurses, doctors for really issues that can be taken, you know, telemedicine, whatever the case may be. Um, millions and millions. I think once we can do some quantitative analytics on it, we, we'll save millions of dollars in ERs by taking the homeless, bringing them up, let us work with them. Um, hopefully in the morning when they get up, they'll accept mental health counseling, they'll accept addictions counseling, job training, whatever the case may be. But we'll never see any of that money. Right, I mean, usually in government it goes towards another sexy idea. We'll have a rail trail, we'll have a, you know, a walkway, a beautiful thing named after a park bench, whatever the case may be. <laughs> and this is, um, this is what we fight with all the time. And, and the problem with having an innovative idea is usually you miss the funding, right? You get out, you find a way to fund it, you get out there and do it, and then, no offense. BJ will come up and they'll say, hey, we've got $2 million, we're gonna roll to this county, that county, and we're like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> We could use just a little help here. So it's a mess, but um, you know, hopefully you know, through the savings anyway, that you'll be able to provide, roll it back into the people that really need it, you know? and that's something that we push for in Albany all the time. Yeah. Doctor, so plug for that. If you want to talk about that, we can geek out about that. Anybody? Yes. It's working yes. in New York now. No. Yes. We need to really roll out telemedicine in a big, big way. Michael, did you have? Yeah, I want to make a. Uh, I want to answer your question without actually answering your question because I'm pretty good at that. Um, <laughs> it doesn't cost money to make a phone call. It doesn't cost money to bring in a collective impact model. Uh, you know, if I'm doing opiate treatment programs, but I know uh, some of my people need family services, I need a family services provider at the table. Where, where it gets complicated for corrections is that you cannot get reimbursed from an agency to go in and provide that work. Well, agencies need to step in and go in and provide that work anyways, uh, you know, especially 30 days pre-release or some kind of, um, boundary that they're comfortable with, but the community needs to get on board and support corrections too. But um, a lot of this work, the, the mayor mentioned earlier, he reallocated time of his existing staff. All those things, there's a million solutions out there and you don't always need money. That's my stance. On that lovely note, thank you. I wanna thank the panelists and thank all of you for uh, attending, thank you. Thanks so much to our great panel. That was a really wonderful discussion. Um, so a couple things before we break for lunch and uh, further work. Uh, the first is that I wanted to make sure that everyone has a copy of our report uh, that has been released this week. Um, this really delves into a lot more uh, information. It provides what uh, Lippy said so eloquently, science and storytelling, and because I'm a lawyer, I sometimes think you need the law to get people's attention, So, because um, nothing like a lawsuit to, to draw attention to something. <laughs> um, so we talk about that in here. Um, and. Also, um, I, as I was thinking about this panel, I also think it's, you know, this is beyond the scope of today's discussion, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of discussion going on about criminal justice reform, so we keep people from being sentenced. What we're talking about today are those individuals who are incarcerated, who are going through the nation's jails as an intervention point. Uh, and then also, Arnold Ventures, um, we have Julie here from Arnold Ventures, uh, who can probably talk about the work that they're doing on uh, criminal justice reform as well as justice reinvestment and the purpose of justice reinvestment is to get those dollars put back into the right pockets. Um, so it's not a perfect system but that's something that, that I'm sure you can all can talk about. Um, and I think it's great that folks are introducing themselves at the lunch break. Uh, you will pick up your lunch at in uh, the Fisher Colloquium, which is that big room that you uh, near where you registered and the coffee was served. Uh, three of the panels will be in that room. Uh, one of the panels will be on legislative action to drive change, where we'll be talking about federal and state policies, and I wanna talk about methadone vans for anyone who'll listen to me <laughs> once again. Um, We'll also talk about best practices and models for financing and operationalizing reforms. Uh, and that will be led by uh, two of our colleagues from Oasis in New York. And then the intersection with HIV, Hep C, prevention and treatment uh, from a couple of folks from the O'Neill Institute, Jeff Crowley and Sonia Kansader. 
and then so everyone will uh, get their lunch and uh, take a couple minutes to uh, so we'll start those convenings those breakouts around 12:15, uh, and then we'll go until that will go until um, until about 1:30. So you'll have lots of time for opportunities to get into in-depth conversations, which is what we wanted from today. And then also, uh, the other breakout we're having is on the legal landscape and litigation. Um, that will be in Hariri 415. So if you are facing Fisher Colloquium, that big room, it's to the right. Uh, so you have to walk down a little walkway to the right, and we'll have signs for that. Uh, so again, pick up your lunches in Fisher Colloquium. We'll have the breakout room, breakout areas, uh, and then Hariri 415 is to talk about legal landscape and litigation. And we'll be back here at 1.30. Thank you very much.